Testing. Testing one, two. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Code for Lib 2023 day Thursday. <laughs> Two. Uh, I'm Trey Pendragon, no relation. I hope everybody had a good night last night. For those of us here in person, how about that reception? <laughs> All right, I have a bunch of things to get through this morning, so stick with me here. Uh, so first of all, Zoom speakers, uh, if you could please monitor Slack during your talks or try to keep your own time, as we might continue to have problems with hearing you or with hearing me or other people from the in-room mics. Uh, it'll help things go a little smoother. Uh, everyone else, if you have any questions for the speakers during this conference, uh, please, and you have questions for them to put in the Slack channel, uh, please start them with a capital Q so that the speakers can scan for that and see them quickly. It's the most efficient way to do Q&A. So if I say, Q, Trey, what's going on? Good? All right. Uh, so we do have pitch, or we do have breakout sessions today. So pitches for the breakout sessions are posted on the poll next to the For Science sponsor table. There's still a bunch of spaces available. Uh, breakouts are very fun. You, so that is over there. You got to look. It's over there. All right, great. Lightning talks will be from 10.15 to 11 o'clock. There's still a bunch of lightning talks to give. I highly recommend them. It's easy, they don't have to be five minutes long. Uh, there are a couple of sign-up spots. You can find the sign-ups uh, on the post near the registration deck. So if you, if you could see through the wall, it would be through there. Uh, our local planning committee has organized a couple of tours on Friday, uh, you should have registered for them already. The special collections tour is at 2 p.m. and tours of the Firestone Library are at both 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. Uh, if you did register, you should have gotten an email reminding you of what you signed up for. If you can't attend, please go to the registration desk and let them know so that they know about how many people to expect and they don't leave without you. Uh, if you did not sign up during registration and you're interested in participating, there might be a couple of spots available. Uh, just stop by the registration desk and they'll should be able to set you up. Yes, I can do that. Thank you, Candy Bar. Uh, let's see. There are so posters for later. The poster display boards will be set up by the sponsor tables during lunch breaks. So look for those during lunch. Uh, every poster presenter will get one side of a board or a poster easel. We'll have tape available at the registration desk for displaying your posters. Poster presenters, please get your posters up before the poster session at 3.30. You're going to do that, right? Great. 
uh, but preferably as early as possible so people can browse it during the afternoon break. So you're going to do them earlier than 3.30. We're reading this together. Uh, I am going to now bring us to the schedule. Uh, no, I did that already. Look at that. Uh, the community support volunteers for the morning are Carolyn Cole and Francis Cayua until 11 a.m. You can find them back there. They have zebra striped lanyards. Uh, after, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., it's going to be Anne Marie Mesco and Bobby Fox. Uh, you'll be able to find them at that time in the same spot in that back. And they'll also have zebra striped lanyards. The online community support volunteer right now is Kevin on Slack. You should have seen a message uh, until 11 a.m. Then Esme Cole's on Slack from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Next up is the best part of this morning. Uh, I want to congratulate our 2023 diversity scholarship recipients. So I'm going to name them all out. We're going to give them lots of applause. We've got Elaine Kong, Chris, yeah, okay, let's do it. Christine Salek, Wen Lin, Emily O'Brien, Kaylin Bennett, Sierra Ladisa, Maria Lauren, Tung Zhuang, and if I got anybody's names wrong, please find me afterwards and I'll fix it. A uh, big thank you to MIT Libraries, Princeton University Library, OCLC, and Developers for Diversity and generous individuals in the Code for Live community for making those scholarships possible. And again, thank you to those folks, not only for applying, but for coming out here. This conference is better for your participation. Thank you so much. All right, we'd also like to thank our sponsors at the supporter level. These are Archive Space, UBC, the School of Information, UNC, the School of Information and Library Science, and Carnegie Mellon University, University Libraries. Supporter level sponsors, thank you. Oh, I've gone way too fast. All right, we got seven minutes, everybody get clapping. <laughs> All right, what do we want to do? Do we want to start early? All right, everybody, we are going to start early. Our first talk is in person, it's 20 minutes long. It's Ryan McCarthy. Uh, the talk is titled Breaking into Prison, Bringing Library Resources to Incarcerated Learners. There you go, get big claps. Thank you. All right, uh, how's this? Can everyone hear me okay? Wow, that's a lot of people. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm gonna begin appropriately with a confession. My title is maybe a little bit misleading. First, I will not be talking about any kind of elaborate heist sort of scenario. If you're expecting me to like put on a hoodie and type really fast and then look up dramatically and say, we're in. <laughs> Wrong presentation. Second, and not to start things off on a down note, but getting into prison in the United States is very easy. Millions of people have done it. 
getting information into a prison is a much bigger challenge. More than 100,000 college students in the US are currently incarcerated, and that number could more than double by the end of the year. So there are a lot of people who need that challenge to be met. Some of these students have never visited a library on the outside, and some will never be able to. A library on the inside can be quite good, with plenty of books, workspaces, and staff support. It can look like this. Or it can be a dozen beat up paperbacks in a plastic bin that gets circulated from one dorm to another until it's mostly just a box of loose pages. So what can get by the electrified razor wire fences and the concrete walls and get academic resources to people trying to learn? I'm going to share some of the work that the JSTOR Access in Prisons initiative has done and talk about some of the decisions we've made in the course of that work. This started in 2007 when the Bard Prison Initiative reached out to Ron Snyder at JSTOR Labs and also in this room right now uh, to build a version of the JSTOR search index that could fit on a thumb drive. And a descendant of that is still in use today. It lets higher education programs run a small version of the index on a thumb drive, or on a laptop, or on a local server if they have the ability to manage that. But in, a, in exchange for something that's easy to run on underpowered hardware without much or any technical support, some compromises have to be made. First off, the full JSTOR index contains some 14 million documents and takes up the better part of a terabyte. That's not something most of the computers inside prisons can handle. So the first step is cutting down the number of documents. Using only the 500,000 most popular, uh, the most accessed, cuts down the size pretty dramatically while still giving access that reflects a significant percentage of overall use. But we can save even more space JSTOR indexes and stores the full text of each document, but by keeping only the index without storing the full text and otherwise limiting the stored data to the sort of bibliographical information that you'd use on the front end, the stuff you see in the search results, that almost a terabyte is pared down to about three gigabytes, while still providing a sizable body of work across every discipline in an index that makes it relatively discoverable. So once we have an index, what do we do with it? It probably won't surprise you to learn that search engines are mostly not meant to run on thumb drives. For most applications, the search engine would be on a server where it belongs. It's at home there. That's what the documentation tells you to do. But if you've ever seen a prisoner MacGyver up a lighter out of batteries and tinfoil, you know that just because it wasn't meant to doesn't mean that it can't. Elasticsearch will run, and it can be configured so it's sufficiently self-contained that it doesn't need to store anything on the host outside or outside of a given directory. And that allows it to run either directly on the thumb drive or on just about any device that has three or four gigabytes free. The index alone doesn't include any content. And while being able to search for articles is great, it's difficult to do research without being able to actually read articles. So what happens when someone finds an article they want? This is where things can get a little bit messy. They can submit a request, but that can't be transmitted online because the computers aren't connected to a network. So a teacher has to go and collect all the requests, save the CSV files, gather them together, take them out of the prison, go to a library on the outside, look up and print out the articles, bring them back in, go through security review, and then distribute them. And depending on the program, the facility, the security requirements, and a bunch of other factors, that can take anywhere from a day, maybe two, up to a month, maybe two, uh, I hope that in the next few months we'll be able to include a small number, maybe one or 2,000 of the most popular PDFs, but there's a bit of a complex encryption scheme involved in making that work. This diagram sort of roughly maps that out, and I won't spend a bunch of time on it, but it can be, it's in the slide deck, and definitely ask me about it if you're interested. So the offline index is a good option for facilities or programs that won't allow internet access, which is a lot. But, and once we're able to get some content on there, it will get better. But it's also very limited in terms of how much content we can provide and even how much content we can make searchable. Fortunately, more and more facilities are getting online, and that trend is likely to continue for at least the next several years. Five states are already allowing incarcerated people full access to JSTOR, which is provided free. Uh, but in many states, prisons tend to be pretty restrictive about what sites they'll allow and what information gets inside. Just as an example, consider a few headlines from The Atlantic over the past several years. The true story of the married woman who smuggled her boyfriend out of prison in a dog crate. A prison escape from little Siberia. And finally, this is how you break out of prison. 
we might hope that peer-reviewed journal articles wouldn't be much of a concern, and for some articles in some states, that's absolutely true. But different states have very different guidelines. Michigan, for instance, has banned a lot of foreign language content, including Spanish and Swahili dictionaries. The thousands of Spanish language journal articles available on JSTOR might be an issue there. Oregon, on the other hand, banned Windows 10 for dummies for, quote, containing information that would create clear and present danger. Dozens of journals in the fields of computer science and technology might raise flags there. I could go on for literally hours because there are thousands upon thousands of books banned for just about anything you might think of from containing tax forms to encouraging role playing. That said, it's also useful to recognize that there are legitimate reasons to be concerned about information coming into a prison, even for those of us who feel an immediate revulsion at these kinds of restrictions. For instance, if an article contains details from the trial or the family life of a person incarcerated in, in a facility, letting that article in might endanger that person's safety. In a prison where white supremacist gangs are a problem, you might not want articles that include passages from the Turner Diaries or other Nazi propaganda. Even if the article is contextualizing that content, having it floating around the facility might be a concern. So how can you build something that allows some control of what material gets through while still designing things to make sure that as much as possible does become available? To put it another way, can you restrict access without building a sensor matic And that brings us to what we've called mediated JSTOR. Mediated JSTOR is essentially something that offers the full cap search capabilities of the JSTOR you know and perhaps love, at least like, with an additional layer between the reader and the content. This is online, so there are no limitations on the size of the index. Researchers can look for anything and see exactly the same results they'd get on JSTOR. The difference is that if I find something I want to read here, I can't just view the PDF immediately. What I can do is submit a request for access. Administrators authorized by the Departments of Corrections or higher education programs can review those requests and approve or deny them. Anything that gets approved by an administrator in a given area, usually a state, will immediately and automatically be available to anyone in that area. We did take a few design steps just to sort of push in the direction of approval wherever possible. The Approve button is prioritized by color and location. Uh, the arrow is not there on the actual website, although I kind of wish it were. <laughs> More importantly, approval is generally a one-click process. Hit that button and it's done. Everyone in the state can now view that PDF in the browser. We also allow bulk approval of entire journals or disciplines. With two clicks, you can approve every single article in languages and literature. That's about two million documents. You can even approve the entire corpus. Two clicks, that's it. In fact, at least one state has already taken that approach. Because a later denial of an individual document will override a bulk approval, they can always go back and deny something later if a particular article turns out to be an issue for them. So it's easy to approve things, either individually or in bulk. And once they're approved, they're immediately accessible. On the other hand, if you want to deny material, you've got to fill out a form. You have to choose the reason you're denying material from a list based on common guidelines in carceral facilities. And it also requires additional comments spelling out specifically wh what's objectionable or where in the document it's located. Finally, it includes a note indicating that there's a record showing who made the denial, what the reason was, and when. The goal of all this essentially is to require that thought be applied to each denial decision. You can't do it in one click, and you've got to at least type something. So, there are a few things we've done to encourage approvals, but we also had to take some steps to convince departments of corrections to allow the site at all, regardless of what content was on it. What it takes to get a site approved varies from state to state. And some of you may be familiar with some of these issues if you've dealt with the procurement processes of various state bureaucracies. Some may require potentially costly certifications for things like FedRAMP. Others may have long review processes that will take months or years to complete. Whatever the process is, it's likely to be required for every subdomain the site uses in any way. So if you're only getting one subdomain approved, that means that any network request going out from the site needs to be going to that subdomain. No Google Analytics, no external links, no static resources in a CDN, no separate API subdomain. Everything has to be bundled together, and routing needs to be managed to accommodate that on the server. When administrators are evaluating a site for use in carceral settings, the first question they usually ask is whether there will be any way to access social networks, email, or other communication tools. 
if you're building something from scratch, it's pretty easy to say, yeah, I didn't accidentally connect this to the Twitter API. And even if you did, there's not much reason to think it would work anymore anyway. So this might not seem like too big an issue. But even in states that allow access to full JSTOR without any content review, they still require that the chat support feature be disabled. So there may be issues to consider, even if you don't really think of your site as providing communication tools. Another one of the big concerns is log storage. If a problem arises and site logs are going to be used in a criminal case, they need to be available for all the years that a trial can drag on. It might not be very likely, especially if there are no communication features there to worry about, but for some states, it's important that sites they allow commit to storing the logs for as long as necessary. But just as I don't want to build a censorship machine, I also don't want to build a surveillance tool, and there's kind of a tension there between getting data to make good data-driven decisions that can benefit incarcerated learners and adding extra surveillance to the most surveilled people on Earth. One way we mitigate that is by not having user accounts. In most cases, all the requests coming from prisons in a given state will have the same IP address, so we can use that for authentication. And this actually solves two problems at once. One is that it makes it a little more difficult to monitor or surveil individuals because we just can't get that granular. The other is that user account management is a bit of a challenge for folks who aren't allowed to have email. If forgetting your password means you have to wait for someone to put money in your account so you can buy paper and stamps and an envelope and a pen and then mail in a letter to request a new password, there are going to be problems. Avoiding that has obvious benefits for incarcerated people, but it also reduces the administrative burden on the departments of corrections who don't have to process that mail or deal with grievances being filed about lack of access. Dealing with resource constraints is part of the process, whether that means reducing the need for account management or reducing the need for potentially expensive hardware and software. It's not that hard to design for the latest and greatest, and you can have a site that is blazing fast on an M2 MacBook Pro with the latest version of Chrome. But how does it run on a 2015 Dell that hasn't had a software update in three years? Or a Chromebook that only has four gigs of memory? If someone only has a couple hours a week that they can access a computer at all, Waiting ages for a request to go through or for a PDF to download over a slow network connection can be a real roadblock. Trying to build a system that's relatively fast and relatively stable while working with those constraints around limited access and limited resources is a balancing act. And again, I'll give kind of just a quick glimpse of what that balance looks like in terms of infrastructure for this project. And if the details here are of interest, check this out in the slide deck or definitely ask me about it. Uh, sometimes trying to strike that balance just doesn't work. One approach we pursued that would help mitigate the hardware constraints is a kind of plug-and-play search appliance built on an Intel NUC with a read-only file system. The idea was that it could just be plugged into a local network and provide hosting for something like the offline index on a thumb drive, but with way more index data and a bunch of open access content. Unfortunately, in addition to some build challenges involving that read-only file system, that setup also required on-site support for installation, maintenance, and especially networking. In practice, it wasn't really sustainable for a lot of facilities where IT staff have multiple duties, often at multiple sites, and aren't dedicated to just working on education. There aren't many prisons that have the IT staffing and infrastructure to support something like that that aren't at least starting to let incarcerated people get online. One of the best things we can do to encourage use is to make it easy. And in this case, that meant giving up some of the power of a system like this in exchange for the ease of use of the thumb drive. So I started off by suggesting that it's easier to get yourself in, into prison than it is to get information into one. And I hope this has provided a bit of an overview of the challenges anyone might face in trying to get resources inside, whether those challenges are administrative, technological, or social. It's not easy, but I do think that it's important work. And I'm going to conclude with a story about why those resources are so valuable to the people inside. I'm formerly incarcerated. And this is the largest room I've ever said that in by a long shot. <laughs> when I was booked into the county jail, they handed me a long sheet of paper with a bunch of fine print laying out rules and policies and procedures, when you can use fingernail clippers, when you can shave, when you can do laundry. And near the top of that list, it said that at some point, I was going to be allowed to access a library. And at that moment, it, like, the heavens opened up and a choir of angels sang to me. I'm only barely exaggerating. Short of opening the gates and just saying, like, go on, get out of here, buddy. That was like the best thing anyone could have said to me on one of the worst days of my life. When I made it down to the pod where I was going to spend the next few months of my life, 
with a mattress rolled up under one arm and a pillowcase with underwear and sheets in the other. I walked up to the guard desk to ask where my cell was. And after he told me, before I even turned around and looked for it, the first thing I said was, when will I be able to go to the library? And he just, he pointed down at his desk. And I said, I don't understand. And he may have had many fine qualities. Eloquence was not among them. He just kind of did this again, pointed down. And so I kind of, I looked around a little bit and I looked in front of the desk and there was a plastic bin, just like that. Uh, inside it, there were a couple of scraps of paper and a single page that had fallen out of a mass market paperback. And I realized then that box was the library. Every couple of weeks, everyone would turn in all the books they had and the boxes would be rotated. When a new box arrived, dozens of men crowded around it, desperate for anything to help pass the time. Even a book that had cracked apart where the whole first half was missing would be better than staring at the wall for another day. The box would be empty in seconds and would mostly stay empty until the guard called for the books to be returned for another rotation. The books may not have been what I'd have picked for myself. I'll always remember a romance novel called The Pirate Next Door, which I never actually got to read because as far as I could tell, the only thing left of it was the cover. I can't tell you what it would have meant to me and to those men to have resources like the ones I've described today. We didn't have them, and as prisoners will, we made do. But I can tell you that every day inside was a struggle not to come out worse than I was when I went in. And if getting this tool, these tools inside has made even one person struggle a little bit easier, I count that as a victory. And I just want to take a quick moment before I wrap up to thank all the people who've worked to make this program happen in JSTOR Labs and JSTOR as a whole at Ithaca, in higher education programs, in libraries, even in departments of corrections, and especially the Ascendium Foundation and the Mellon Foundation, whose grants have made this work possible. I would run up to lunch if I tried to name any, everyone involved. I'm not joking, it's a lot of people. And I do wanna leave a couple of minutes for questions, but it's a privilege for me to be able to do this work, and I'm deeply grateful to the people and organizations who've made it possible. Uh, and I also just wanna thank all of you for listening, and now I hope we have just a minute or two for questions. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk. Oh, is there time for questions? Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about, um, given like all the, a lot of the censorship that's been happening of like libraries and stuff like that, um, the experience you've seen or heard about at JSTOR with the different levels of access to different kinds of records in federal or state or the different levels of prisons? Yeah, uh, so I can say we haven't worked with the federal prison system yet. Um, and there are some interesting distinctions uh, in terms of what different places will allow. Uh, most of what I've seen in terms of variation has been between, uh, between states rather than between different levels. Uh, for instance, there are county jails in Massachusetts that are providing uh, access to full JSTOR. Uh, and then there are prisons that are providing access uh, in, say, Colorado to the mediated version of JSTOR. Other places are testing that. There are higher education programs in a bunch of different places using the thumb drives. And kind of each of those, as I suggested, has a different level of access control. Um, so I haven't seen that much distinction in terms of the different levels of prisons and what they'll allow. It seems to be more regional variation. Hi, thank you so much for your, hi, I'm over here. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your talk. Um, there's a little bit of discussion in the Slack about ways um, for librarians and other folks in the room to get involved uh, just helping um, support information to incarcerated folks. So what, what, what would be your recommendation for folks who are interested in getting involved or volunteering or joining kind of this effort? Yeah, so we actually have a, uh, a working group that's working on some of this stuff and I will post, uh, the Stacy Burnett, the project manager on this, I'll post her contact info in the Slack and people can reach out to her. Or you can talk to me. I don't necessarily know all the details about sort of what people might be able to do to contribute, but absolutely talk to me and I'll do my best to help out with whatever it is that anyone is interested in doing. <laughs> Hi. 
Um, sort of following on from that, are there other programs that are working to get uh, information into prisons? There are absolutely. Uh, there are books to prisons programs. Those are fantastic. Uh, I'm not too aware of a lot of places trying to get um, kind of academic material in and research material other than the higher education programs themselves that are often doing a lot of great work to try to make that happen. Uh, but as far as like a larger organization doing it, um, I'm not aware of too much. I know, uh, I believe EBSCO does have uh, a program associated with prisons, uh, but I'm not too familiar with the sort of technical details of what they're offering. Uh, I know that they charge for it. so. That's kind of a thing some people are, some places are reluctant about. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm curious, is this on? Yes. yes. Okay. I sound normal. Okay. Um, for books that are denied, is there an appeals process at JSTOR? Um, how is that reviewed? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically, the way that it works is when you submit a request, if it gets denied, it'll be marked as denied. And you can go and view completed requests uh, in your region and see if things have been denied. If they have been, uh, you can re-request it. And we're kind of waiting to see how that works out longer term in practice, because that's a system that could lend itself to abuse if someone just keeps requesting things over and over again. Uh, otherwise, that's a thing that will vary from state to state. Every, pretty much every state has a formal grievance process. If something gets denied, uh, you can file paperwork that requests a review. My experience with that has been that it's kind of a joke, but yeah. Uh, so that's part of why we built something into the system that lets people just immediately re-request it. If you, know, if you think something was denied and it shouldn't have been, you can submit the request again. You can add a note. Uh, and hopefully, maybe someone will review it and rethink that. When you say you, do you mean the student or the prisoner? Or yes. Do you mean the, so there's not like an advocate at JSTOR who's reviewing the denials? and. Uh, yes. No, we don't have anyone reviewing denials internally at JSTOR who's able to advocate for people, in part just because um, all those state systems are so different uh, and what they require is so different that there's relatively little we'd be able to do in most cases. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little experiment here. I heard in Slack that this mic is way better, so I would like. I'm hearing confirmation. I'm I'm talking on this, and folks are like way better. Yeah. Okay. So from now on, if you can use this mic while you're presenting, please do so. Uh, next up. If you're going to walk around, if you're going to walk around, like you have to be here. It's okay over here? No. Not in the room. Not in the room. Interesting. All right here. Come on. <laughs> oh, I'm going to fail the Mac test, I know. You it. will not. I got you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do this. What's your, your next? You're this one. That's what I'm for. I got you. Do you it's probably a speaker note. I don't need speaker rights, yeah. Okay. Look at this. Oh, it's done. Oh, sorry about that. How about it? Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Good morning. Uh, it's mi primera vez. This is my first time presenting here at Code for Lib, so I know I'm going to mess it up. So <laughs> thank you so much. So my name is Danny Nanez, and today I wanted to talk to you guys about the digital library on American slavery, right? Uh, I work at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in the Jackson Library. Woo! And I, <laughs> North Carolina, muchas gracias, muchas gracias. So, okay, so what is the digital library on American slavery? What is DLOS? So DLAS is an expanding grant-funded collection of public records that deal with enslavement, right? 
So the address is dlos.uncg.edu if you guys want to check it out. Don't break my site, por favor, don't do that. <laughs> So we have diff uh, three different uh, collections currently at the moment, and they are slave deeds, which are deed records from registers of deeds uh, from about 17 different counties in North Carolina. We have um, runaway slavery ads and the original uh, collection that kind of kicked this whole thing off is the Race and Slavery Petitions Project, right? So a user can come in here and do keyword searches, name searches, and at this layer of the site, they can actually search all three different repositories. You can get search results. At this point, you can export the, the record set itself. And you can come in here and conduct, uh, look at your records, export the search list as well. Oh, sorry, it's Mac. Sorry about that. And you can come take a look at all the metadata and see the file. Okay. Excuse me, Mac. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mac. Okay. <laughs> and so, sorry about that. Again, the Mac test. Okay. Let me get out of this for a second. Oh, my goodness. So is it like a double click or something? Sorry about that. Again, like I said, the Mac test. What are you trying to do? Oh, get out of it. I'm trying to close it. I know I can't get out of this. Oh, just to get out of the record. The image loaded up. There we go. Mac, I'm telling you the full screen stuff kills me. There we go. That works. Are you trying to get back here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Okay. Okay. I'm probably going to need your help again. So. so you can go into the repository and take a look at all this information, and um, it's really interesting. And so as a developer, you know, I'm going through the, you know, my job is to, to put together the back end and put together the database and build the front end. We've all done that. This is a .NET site. We use SQL Server as the back end. So, you know, we started getting these records in the deed project, right? These are deeds from different counties in North Carolina. And so, you know, I'm looking through the records set, trying to get the data in, into the database. And one of the first records that comes up has to do with the Queen Anne's Revenge. Now, I'm not from North Carolina. I'm from Texas. But do you guys know the significance of the Queen Anne's Revenge? It's a ship, right? No? It is Blackbeard the pirate ship, right? So this is an actual historical record. And at this point, we have a very small development team. It's like myself, my supervisor, who work on this project. And so I saw this record, and I sent it out to our librarians, different people in the library, and everybody got excited. They were like, wow, a historical record. It has a lot to do with North Carolina. And it generated a lot of buzz and excitement about what the work that we were doing, right? And so then, as I started looking at other data, and more data was coming in from different counties, sort of the tone of what these records represented started to change for me. I started seeing records where enslaved individuals were being granted or deeded to banks, insurance companies. Uh, companies that are still in operation today. Uh, I, f I forgot at the beginning to warn you guys, uh, some of this material is going to be a little bit difficult. And it's going to get a little bit worse. Sorry, not to be a downer. But these records for me started to change. I started to realize that these are different records, right? And so we started to work with an individual to bring in uh, deed information, a deed data set from uh, the District of Columbia. And I swear to you, this is the record that broke me, right? I started going through the, the data and taking a, took a look at the information and this one. You know, I'm a parent, and to read something about a formerly enslaved woman that had to buy her 21-month-old daughter back for $30 just really affected me. And essentially, this lady, because of the laws and the regulations in the District of Columbia, um, she was essentially the slaveholder of her daughter, which how can you not be affected by that as a person? And so I started to question my role as a developer, right? Is my job just to put together an elegant algorithm or define the right framework, right? As I started looking at this, these people, right, were real 
people. And I felt that as a developer, that my responsibility, you know, was to respect their stories and to honor their lives, right? So how do we do this? Well, there was um, a news, I don't know, there was, there was a discovery about two years ago that was covered in the news, and it was about a slave ship that was found in Alabama. And when NPR was covering this, and I'm going through these records, I'm listening to this stuff on NPR, the people that were being um, interviewed and discussing the find were talking about this discovery using words like breathtaking and amazing and incredible. And one of the first things that I would recommend when working with enslavement information is to tone down the excitement, right? We try to refer to with these records with more respect and more honor, right? And so we, we stop using words like, wow, wow, you know, this is great, and look at this great information, and look at all this work that we're doing, right? So that's the first thing. And as long as we're toning down the excitement, right, the next thing that I recommend is to tone down the site as well, right? So uh, with the Race and Slavery Petitions Project, that was one of the first things that kicked this, the, the data set that kicked this whole thing off. And we have an old original site for that record set as a point of comparison, right? So when I go to the old site itself, um, this is back in 2005, 2006, where we started putting this online. You can kind of see the website, the background, um, the colors, the fonts, and it sort of denotes that this record, this information, is historic. This is like an old historic record, right? Now let me see if I can get out of here. Oh, here we go again. The Mac, sorry about that. I have several links to click on, so. Escape. I don't know. I don't know how you're doing that. So, oh, Apple back. Apple back. I know it. I know it. I know it. I have several to click on. Sorry about that. It's the wrong window. I'm used to Windows. And you can just leave it like that. That's fine too. Okay. I can just do it like that. There we go. If you control click on the link, you can open them up in the new. Tab. In the new tab. Okay. So this is the new site, right? Control click here. Yeah. Command click. Command click. This is Apple. Oh, I did it. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. This is the same record on the new site, right? And so. Like I was saying, uh, the old site had this, you know, this antique-looking font and antique-looking background, and we had decided, I, d I did not design this site, by the way, it was my supervisor, but we both arrived at the same conclusion, right? So we use a lot of muted colors, grays, light grays. We remove distracting backgrounds, and we do that so that we focus on the content, right? We're focusing, trying to get the user in, and get them straight to the material that they're looking for without anything that's kind of distracting from them, right? And as long as we're trying to focus on the content itself, that's the next thing that I, that I can suggest, is to emphasize the content, right? Now, how do we do that? So, let's see here. Here is another site that has enslavement individual information. This is a site out in California by the uh, Department of Insurance, and it is essentially enslaved individuals and the insurance policies taken out on them, right? Now, I'm not here to criticize the site or what it's doing right or what it's doing wrong. It's just I'm here to con you know, use it as a comparison for some of the decisions that we made with our site. So if I come back over here, let's do command. Okay, let me click through this. Okay, so this is the about page. So one thing that uh, we tried to focus on was any of the tangential information, uh, uh, contact information, news, events, honors, anything like that. We pushed it down to the bottom of the site. We pushed it away from the content itself, right? And if you take a look at this page and other pages on the site, you'll see that. You'll just see that. Uh, our information is down at the bottom, news items are down at the bottom, there we go. 
The other thing that you won't see on here are profile pictures of people smiling, anything like that. And that is, uh, like I was saying before, emphasizing the content and getting away from anything that isn't related to the records themselves, right? And so this leads me to my last bit of advice, is to please get some help, right? Um, these records are very, you know, the subject matter and some of the things that you see in these records are very difficult to work with. Uh, they have difficult language, difficult words, difficult subject matter. And so we have an advisory board for DLOS, and at many times throughout the development process, we talk to the advisory committee to get some guidance about how to proceed forward. Because as a developer, we're a small development shop. Like I said, there's only two of us. I felt like I could not make these decisions myself when you're dealing with these difficult things, right? Difficult words, difficult subjects. And the advisory board, which I highly recommend if you're working on this to do, uh, was a really big help. And I wanted to sort of end with why this is all important, right? So these records represent people's lives. These are real people. And so as a developer, I felt that my role was to respect these records, to respect these people's uh, stories, and to respect their lives. And that's what I wanted to end with. Uh, thank you so much. Muchas gracias. The site is dlos.uncg.edu. Questions, thoughts, concerns, premonitions? <laughs> we can take questions inside the channel, but unfortunately we are out of time. Okay, thank that's you cool. very much. Thank you so much. what you want? Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Greer Martin. I'm the Metadata Technologies Librarian at Loyola University Chicago. Um, and I'm presenting today with Margaret Heller, who's the Digital Services Librarian at, also at Loyola. Um, so today uh, we'll be presenting our um, presentation, Documenting Movements Using MUCA2 as a Platform for a Contemporary Video Archive. Um, so we just wanted to begin with a list of our collaborators on this project. Um, so we'll be hearing from the Lakota People's Law Project in a minute. Um, but just to introduce them, the Lakota People's Law Project partners with Native communities to protect sacred lands, safeguard human rights, promote sustainability, reunite indigenous families, and more. It is an initiative of the Romero Institute which is an interfaith law and policy center focused on climate change and protecting human rights. Um, so we have a short video from um, the Lakota People's Law Project, which we'll refer to as LPLP in this presentation. If we can start now. Homadaki api chante washte na be chiyus bapelo lila gaiawa uelo. My name is Chase Iron Eyes. As you know, we went through and are still going through an enormous fight, an enormous struggle to protect and defend our way of life. I'm familiar with the archive that you're working with. I'm familiar with all of the, the work that goes on behind the scenes.
And I know that the work you're doing is important. It is legacy work. It is important that the stand with Standing Rock and the Ocheti Shakowi is known throughout the world because we will continue to be confronted by those forces, by those forces which still seek to diminish our understanding of who we are as human beings, seek to encroach upon our treaty rights, our constitutional rights, and our human rights. To this end, you are helping us to tell the truth. We are all telling the truth together. If you may have seen our recent series in Dakota Water Wars, which tells of the current crisis that we are facing, not only in terms of climate change, but a water crisis that we should be preparing for. I really believe that we can't go forward unless we go forward with all the tribes the Ochete Shikoi, we have to do this together. And right now, in 2022, the water war has begun. I've been to Loyola in Chicago, and I had a great time. I, I got to meet Professor Shook. I got to meet some of the students. And I appreciate everything that our young people do. And those of us who are in the process of transmitting to our young people now and those who are yet unborn, those who will inherit and benefit from the struggles, the sacrifices, and the deliberations of our time. So what you're doing is extremely important. We see our partnership continuing to strengthen and to, to know that what you're doing has immense meaning. And, and I send this to you in, in our good way from the Ocheti Shakoi or the Sioux Nation from our homelands here. Lila Wopila Tonka Ichichapalo. Thank you. Um, so that was kind of an introduction to the project, um, an overview of it, um, but I'm going to get into, we'll get into some more details, um, starting with the project's history. Um, so to give some background, the LPLC had an existing relationship with a faculty member from Loyola's School of Environmental Sustainability, Dr. Michael Shuck. Um, and for his environmental justice class, students were granted access to the LPLP's cloud-based media management system, Iconic. Um, and there the students were able to add tags to videos, curate their own collections, and download content to be used in their final projects. Um, so a couple of years ago, the libraries were approached by the School of Environmental Sustainability and LPLP to host the collection so that it could be used um, in scholarship and teaching more broadly um, and eventually made accessible to the public. The libraries chose Mukutu as its platform for this project, um, and after a small pilot in late 2021, we launched the Lakota People's Law Project Digital Archive in fall 22 for use by students in Dr. Shuck's environmental justice course. Um, the, the archive currently includes 1,200 videos, um, including on-the-ground Dakota Access Pipeline footage, all of the interviews related to Chase Iron Eyes trial, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe meetings in DC and Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance meetings. Um, so now I'll get into Mukutu specifically, uh, its data model and why it was a good fit for this project. The Mukutu CMS is modeled on the principles of slow archives in which curatorial access, description and management decisions are made by or in collaboration with the communities that the collections represent. Um, in Jane, uh, sorry, Kimberly Christian's article Towards Slow Archives, which was co-authored with Jane Anderson, defines these principles and the ways in which Mukutu applies them. It's um, currently developed and maintained by the Center for Digital Scholarship and Curation at Washington State University. And the data model places communities and cultural protocols really at the center of everything. 
Um, so how that works is each community in Mukutu contains at least one cultural protocol which determines access to the site's content. Um, so cultural protocol is used outside of technology, of course, but in technical terms um, within Mukutu, a cultural protocol is a set of user accounts which all have access to the same content um, in Mukutu. So every item, in this case every video and its metadata, has to be associated with at least one cultural protocol and parent community. In fact, you can't ingest an item without first indicating what cultural protocols and communities it's a member of. This access granularity was appropriate for this collection, which featured a lot of on, on the ground uh, footage of the Dakota Access Pipeline protests at Standing Rock. Um, and as we know from work by the Documenting the Now Project, um, there's always the potential <laughs> for surveillance of the internet by law enforcement and others um, and targeting of those people who are identifiable. So in the first phase of this project, only students in Dr. Schuck's environmental justice class, the LPLP and library staff who worked in the project were given access. Um, but as the goal is wider dissemination of material for scholarship and teaching and to eventually make parts of the collection public, in our next phase, we'll work with LPLP to expand access by identifying other communities that can be added, um, as well as items that are appropriate for public access. Um, and since MUGU2 offers really granular item level access control, this is possible for us to do. Um, so this chart shows our current communities on the left, um, the, the students, LPLP, and us. Um, and then on the right are the communities that we've begun to identify with LPLP um, that can be kind of future communities um, for access and as well as for collaboration in our next phase. Um, so to enable our current communities, especially the environmental justice students, to use the site and find content, um, we added, we and the library team added some very basic metadata. Um, and this is known in Mukutu as Mukutu Essentials Metadata. It's just communities and cultural protocols associated with each item, as well as date, creator, title, and very de brief description of what the video depicts. Um, and Margaret will talk a little more about that. But a core feature of Mukutu is expanded description beyond those kind of standard description, descriptive metadata fields in order to provide cultural context and traditional knowledge associated with the items. Um, this is known as Mukutu core metadata and typically is provided by the community collaborators um, and not by us in the library who are just kind of trying to build the site for the students. Um, so this model places this kind of cultural and cultural context um, and traditional information alongside of standard metadata fields um, so that it's, a, it's able to be presented at the same level but distinct from a standard Dublin Core style description field. Um, so in our next phase, we hope to have future communities collaborate on this description. Um, and Christian and Anderson in their Towards Slow Archives article state that descriptive work should be iterative and evolving rather than static and with a goal towards a final project. And so we hope that um, expanding description in this way in a, in a next phase will be an illustration of that. Okay, so I will um, zip through this last part where we're going to talk a little bit about the technical ways that we made this happen. So um, particularly thinking about Mukutu as a video archive and the particular um, things that we've learned through experimentation. Um, so unlike a text archive, users can't quickly ascertain um, relevance of items um, in the same way that with, so some base level of context is important. So um, as Greer mentioned, the existing file naming structure in Iconic indicated the metadata, which we adapted in bulk um, as the MUCA2 essential metadata, and then we assigned the categories um, to give students a framework for finding relevant material for their research topics. Then they added keywords to add, add additional concepts. And then ultimately we will export the um, metadata in JSON to um, go back to the iconic metadata so we have this sort of round trip for that metadata. Um, the actual process for importing um, the media, so MUCA2 is based on Drupal um, and it uses the Scald contributed module rather than the Drupal media module which provides some additional flexibility and scalability. 
Um, but video migration brings additional complexity due to the file size and the need for thumbnails. So we, pro we followed this process for migrating the videos and um, in metadata from Iconic and creating a, an experience that was basically usable for the students. So, um, so we actually got the 1,200 videos, as Greer mentioned. They shipped on a hard drive. Um, so we loaded uh, the videos in, in um, batch-created thumbnails using an automated process. Um, then to upload it, so the way this works is you upload all the, the media first and then you create items associated with them. So we uploaded all the batches of videos and thumbnails from the um, hard drive and then manually matched all the thumbnails. There is an automated process for matching thumbnails, but we can never get it to work. So shout out to our student worker for doing a lot of tedious work there. Um, so then for creating the digital heritage items, we were able to then get the Scald Atom ID for the file and then create a CSV in Google Sheets, which is the best one to, for this purpose, matching the cleaned iconic metadata with the Scald ID and then the communities and categories ID. So that could all be done in bulk um, to create the, all the digital heritage items. Um, okay, we also had a lot of the issues work with server considerations are really important with, with this. So video is big and streaming is hard. Um, so actually a lot of people use a service called Reclaim Hosting for hosting Mooka2, but it's not a good option for video due to the size. Um, in, our si in our situation, it was actually easier to get a budget for um, a server than for video hosting. So we are self-hosting this on, on campus. Um, it's it could be a challenge. So um, despite the fact that it's not a video focused CMS like Iconic was, Mooka2 allows that flexibility of access for all the reasons Greer mentioned. Um, the Mooka2 team actually recommends private Vimeo as the best option because paid plans have privacy settings that work with Mooka2 data model. But in either case, low internet speeds available to some of the communities, um, oh, so, yeah, we're, we're going to bring some difficulties, but Mooka2 Mobile provides some offline access. So I'm not going to have time to go into everything, but we do have our slides um, in OSF. Um, but I just want to show one thing here, um, transcripts we have. Um, so we had students edit the transcripts in a cloud service um, and um, called subtitle. So they, uh, so, subtitle edit, so they were able to um, edit the transcripts, and then we were able to provide those back to, um, back to LPLP. Um, so you can see it's pretty easy to use. And then we store the transcripts in Mooka2. There are two different ways to do it. So we attach them as a file, as a text file. We also have the transcript built in. So we have to figure out which is going to be more usable for which purpose and which audience. Um, so different places here. Um, and I just want to um, highlight, we really are hoping to make this a larger project. Um, so please get in touch if you're interested in uh, working on this project. We really want to get um, a lot more of the library community on board with this to help out with this project. Um, so our contact information is there. Thank you. All right, thank you both so much. Next up, I believe, let me look at my notes. I don't want to say this kind of thing and not be correct. I believe we're headed into a break. Uh, so, the I should have marked these things off. Uh, okay, we are headed into a 15 minute break. Uh, we'll be back here at 10.15 and then we have lightning talks. There are a couple of lightning talks sign up spots still. If you have lightning talks coming up and you need to get something on this computer and you haven't yet, please come up here and I'll help you do that. So great. See you all in 15, well, more like 13.
later. If you haven't gotten Lightning Talk stuff up here, please do it. All right, if you're giving a lightning talk, I'd appreciate if you'd get up here and line up a little bit in order by that name that you see at the, on the board. Just a minute and we'll be doing this. Okay, everybody, it's time for lightning talks. If you're out there, come back in here. Okay, so we have a full slot of lightning talks. As a reminder, it's up to five minutes per talk. Uh, gonna go pretty rapid fire, I'm very excited. Ready to go? All right, come on up. First up, we've got Patrick Murray John. I, good morning. I am very happy to say that not even the Macintosh will defeat me because I have no slides to give. Instead, I, I'd like to get closer, okay. I would like to tell you a story. Uh, this is a story that I often think of when I uh, see lots of wonderful accessibility presentations. And this goes back to long, long ago when I was but a wee grad student, uh, one of my first teaching assistantship gigs. And so I, I was nervous, I was excited, kind of like right now. And I had a deaf student in my class. And so, uh, Yikes. I, uh, a deaf student came in, interpreter, introduced themselves, usual practice there. 
And I, I went about my, my presentations as usual. And after one of them, they came up to me and, and asked me to do something very different. And here's the thing that I was doing that messed them up. It was a room set up a, a little like this. Speaker here, slides, screen there. And I did this. I did this thing a lot where I would have something on the screen and to call attention to it, I would say, okay, everybody look at that thing up there or look at this thing down there. And they came up to me and said, that really messed up the entire interpretation process because the student was trying to look at me and the interpreter at the same time, but that pointing, that deictic, made it so there was just too many things going on. They couldn't pay attention to it all. And I had never thought of that, that that kind of pointing all the time made that interpretation problem so much uh, more difficult. And I'm reminded of this story because of that, that pointing. It's like, look at this, look at this, look at this. Kind of like, click here, click here, click here. Yeah. Uh, and so I learned a lot from that. And it made me uh, usually, I hope, a better speaker. Because I wouldn't do that as much it forced me to reflect on my teaching, how I presented, all that good stuff. So that was me learning a lot from that student that day about trying to be more accessible. I have more stories, but I think I will leave those for another time. Thank you. Hi, folks. I'm Matt Sherman, um, and I think we just click and drag. Yep, click and drag. Cool. So, back in 2014, I got re was reached out by. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I was gonna wait to drag it over, but we have fine lives. Um, so I uh, was reached out by an old coworker who was an English librarian with a, a question of. He sent me a link to this uh, annotated bibliography is like, hey, do you think we could turn this into a database? Looking at it, it's like, yeah, hey, there, there's, there's author, there's title, there's some biblio info, there's an annotation. Yeah, there, there's some legit fields. Yeah, let's give it a shot. And, you know, three years of putzing with it later, uh, having taught myself regular expressions, thankfully he was able to get a clean OCR from... Uh, 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 the group who did this scan uh, for us to work with. Uh, and some of the folks who are at the LA conference may have seen me putzing around with cleaning this up, uh, was able to take the OCR, learn regex, learn the Zen of regex to realize I didn't need to try and, you know, f capture all of this stuff. I just needed to break, break it up into uh, tabs to turn it into tab delimited text files so it was semi-structured. I then had a spreadsheet with these very rudimentary metadata items, which we could then uh, play around with, was able to throw it into an XML file, a SQLite database, and there it sat for years afterwards because this was one volume with 1,300 records, and we had three more to go, and no funding. Um, and turn, turn around uh, about a year or two ago, some uh, Dunn Variorum folks uh, at, at the University of Saskatchewan uh, who uh, worked with this came to us and was like, hey, we've got this grant. We'd like to roll this into other digital projects we're working on. And so... Thanks to uh, some lovely folks with the University of Saskatchewan, we now have a beta of this data actually being a real thing in the Drupal database. Uh, this is not live yet. There's some work to do, but you can see where it's sort of crossed over and 
Uh, they've this is an older version. Uh, it's they've even like taken the um, the index in the back and made those into subject terms that will provide the linking. And so sometime in the next year or so, this will be a live project that that scholars who are dealing with uh, done work can actually engage with. Uh, so there's no necessarily moral to the story, and there's way more detail in, uh, into the putzing around with this process, but just a bit of an encouragement for folks to step out, try some cool ideas if somebody brings them to you, and hold on to your old projects, because you never know when something might actually become real one day. So that's what I got. Hello, my name is Charles. This is my colleague, Eddie. We're from the University of Miami, and this is our extended elevator pitch of software we developed recently. Uh, it's Orchid Explorer integration at the University of Miami, and I'm going to try to fly through this. So at the University of Miami Libraries, we implemented Ex Libris Explorer. The University of Miami Office of Research Administration spearheaded a campus-wide Orchid adoption initiative Explora was decided to be the source of truth for UM's researcher data, including ORCID IDs. Our app pulls, from, pulls the ORCID data into Ex Libris, Alma, and Explora via OAuth and API connectors. So Explora distinguishes researchers separately from normal Alma users, and not everyone at UM is a researcher in Explora. So Explorer's built-in ORCID connector only works for researchers as defined in Alma. And we needed a solution that could connect ORCID IDs for everyone regardless of researcher status and independent of the Explorer connector. So we developed the ORCID integration tool, a middleware application that could handle all of our use cases. Uh, we use Docker and Azure pipelines for our DevOps environment. The Python libraries included Flask framework for the interface, one SAML for SSO, request for Ex Libris APIs, and Flask Dance for the ORCID OAuth. And here's a uh, diagram. The user logs in through single sign-on to ADFS, which returns the UM identifier, the C number. It then connects to the ORCID API via OAuth and returns the ORCID ID and the ORCID token. It then connects to the Alma user API and stores the ORCID ID, which returns a user object to let us know whether, or the app know whether or not that user is a researcher. If they are not, they're redirected to the success page. If they are, the, uh, it, we connect to the Esploro token API and store the ORCID token. And so now we have a live demo. Place your bets. Uh, there's the. You just hit the, the green button. Yep. Green button. And then you can just drag your tab over. That one. No, let me just open it real quick. Ooh, this keyboard's weird. Okay, so this is the uh, landing page for the app. So we have two options here, whether you uh, have an ORCID ID uh, or you don't. So I have an ORCID ID, but I'm gonna go through the process of if you don't. So click here. Um, so in our user testing, we found uh, that, so what, well, first when you click here, um, it'll open the ORCID registration page in a new tab, uh, but that doesn't complete the process for connecting your ORCID ID to Esploro. So we needed people to remember to come back to the app to finish the integration process. And we found that in our, in our initial testing, uh, people did not remember to come back. They got caught up in the ORCID registration process and filling out their form. So uh, we implemented a 
modal pop-up as an additional reminder. Okay, I'll be back. Uh, I must have double clicked because uh, Macintosh. Uh, so you would do the <laughs> so you would do the registration process uh, and then click back on the on the tab. Uh, I'm going to do now the uh, SSO process. So I will have to log in to a few screens here. This keyboard. Okay, so that registration, uh, the SSO login uh, returns the UM identifier. So now we're going to click on uh, the Connect to ORCID button, which will take me to um, the ORCID sign in page. So this is the ORCID uh, authorization screen. So at this point, it will tell you the, uh, uh, the access that you're giving uh, UM. And uh, upon clicking here is what will start the OAuth process, which will not only save your, your affiliation within your ORCID record, but also return the ORCID ID and the ORCID token. And it will also then call the uh, ALMA, and, uh, API, uh, ALMA and Esploro APIs. So I'm going to go ahead and authorize access. So this will take you to the uh, success page, telling me that my ORCID has been connected. This is a link to my, uh, ORCID, uh, my ORCID record. And uh, next steps include uh, reminding researchers that they can use the ORCID ID when they publish uh, research. That's it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, any questions? Uh, we'll have our poster session later tonight, or later today, so you can come see us there. Good morning, my name is Vera. I'm a software developer at the New York Public Library. I'm not a librarian, but this is my hot take. So the 880 field, for those who are not familiar, is the alternate graphic representation. Um, it's basically used to link transliterations of non-Roman scripts, as well as native non-Roman scripts, so Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, Cyrillic, there's a couple others. Um, yeah, and it's a pain. So this is how we use it um, at the New Public Library. So this English here is, um, that's like the 245, the official title. This Hebrew script here, as well as the, um, the transliteration you see here are saved as 880 uh, linked fields. And they're linked through the subfield six in the original 245 field. So um, just so you know, you're gonna be see some uh, Sierra generated Mark and JSON because I have a certificate from a coding bootcamp, not a master's in library science. So um, this is what we're dealing with when we're indexing records. Um, so here we have 245, it's the title field. Um, and this subfield six here indicates that there is an 880 field here on the right that connects to it. So basically, um, <laughs> Seeing the subfield six here means that, and this O2 means that there's a two four, there's an eight eight there's an eight eighty field that has a subfield six with a content that matches the original mark field of the primary field. So there's two forty five here, and then there's also it has the O2, and that's how you know it links because there could be um, for fields like five hundred where there could be multiple um, authority fields for that. Um, there might be, you know, an o a, a, a two forty five o three or two forty five o one. That's how you know how to link them. What could go wrong? <laughs> um, so um, this kind of links back to what Julie and her colleague were talking about yesterday in the the metadata for everyone talk, where just like trans non Roman scripts are just not the focus of of like Western cataloging. Um, it's very Anglo centric, and this is sort of the practical implication of that, where 
these two data are like pretty asymmetrical. So as a developer, it's a big pain because you have to look, if you, if you start with the, with, the, with the 880 field, you can find the primary field just by looking at this content tag here. But if you start with the 880 field and you go to subfield six and you look at content, there's this redundant piece of information, which is 880. It's a subfield six, so you know it's gonna have a matching 880. So you have to keep track of the mark tag and then go nest it into an array and then nest it into the object within the array and find the, the, the suffix that links that, that will be found in the 880 subfield six content field. <laughs> it sounds complicated, it is. And the practical implications of this is that development was slowed down and so this website that we you saw here was um, released sometime in 2021, and we didn't get the, the, the implementation of the non-Roman scripts rolled out until almost a year after the website was released. Um, so the political implications, of course, are that you know people who are searching in Hebrew cannot find it if they're typing in Hebrew, and just you know we're focusing on the English translation of texts that are not in English. Um, and it's annoying. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is the code that I ended up having to write. It took me like two full days of development work to get this out. It's like 100 lines, including comments, but the comments are necessary because it's so convoluted. Um, so yeah, how does your library deal with 880 linked fields? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yilin Chen, so um, I work at Virginia Tech. So uh, these days I see many good presentations, so I just want to share what I did in the uh, Virginia Tech library. And uh, I didn't prepare this, I just like, just used this morning to prepare. And uh, because I don't want lighting talk, we can just jump in, so I just write my name here. Okay, so uh, what we do in here, so in the past we just put everything on primers, okay, and uh, using just using software um, and uh, to create service. And uh, at some stage, you just want to see um, a, a lot of things are repeat. And uh, if you lay out servi the service out there, we can just use that, and uh, we just use that. So save us some work, because since you, you don't have many developer there. So we all want to build different kind of uh, library solutions, right? Just like based on the stakeholder and uh, a lot of different scenarios. And uh, no matter which one have a different kind of process, just like what you see here, I believe many of you are very familiar. Just like, okay, uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is process, we need to like, figure out each, each part or, or each steps. Right. So we build a platform and uh, we like our new project like, just like simulates many different kind of platform you build on your universities. We have a lot of service, we just like similar concept, just with a different lens, and we want to support many sites, and uh, do the preservations, and uh, put files in the AWS cloud or whatever cloud, right? And uh, then we don't want to, like in the past, we just want one service, so maybe we, we use the full stack and uh, to customize this. But we want to reuse everything, so like, for example, we want, so we want to write stack from the left to the right, so we want to see if this service, this microservice we can reuse and uh, can be used by many other sites. So we just maintain this platform we don't need and uh, can support many other sites. So we just need to focus on one single item among that. So we choose the AWS solutions, yeah, because it's very convenient to do that. So to integrate with AWS, not necessarily need, you need to have a lot of uh, backend knowledge on the AWS. So we can use tools, right? So in here we use a, a, a AWS Amplify. It's an open source tools, 
and uh, fun is React. So React, you can replace any other kinds of uh, JavaScript applications. And uh, backend with tool is uh, Appify open source. And uh, they then to handle the uh, backend uh, AWS integration, as you can see in here. So we just like uh, define the schemas and uh, tell them what to do. And uh, they just generate the code for us. And uh, we just handle the rest of that. We just think about uh, our logic and how to build our site. And so, like, do a presentation, we can just use the solutions. So in the middle part, very complex. I, don't, I didn't even need to implement that. I just adapt that. So this service provided by AWS, I just customize this into our solutions. And also, like, OK, they have steps. Because microservice is like event-driven, so it's connected with others, right? So we need to keep a state, prevent the uh, single failure of failures. All right, and also like then we need to like create a mint, like unique ID, we can just simple using Lambda. We don't need to a server, just using that. And uh, of course, you in insert a metadata index, you can use in another Lambda. So just like with Lambda, you can in create a unique ID, put it in a database, and uh, put it into a search, you can for, for the end users. And also you can do let's Google just like do the data transformations. For example, you want to convert from one standard format Dublin code to whatever LinkedIn link data or something. And uh, of course the scaling is important. So we also use uh, implement the service using data to scale. So depending on how many images, we don't care. As long as they have a service layer using the AWS powers, we just create multiple parallel jobs to to handle the rest and put the output into S3. And uh, once we build the infrastructure, we can just like just switch that so you can see these two are very similar. We just based on our logic, we just switch the component in there. Right, so it's one of the integrate with the drive. And also we can create something else. We don't want to create it by ourselves. We just using automatically using Nana to create that. So what we did is just like we just treat this each service just like Legos. And based on different use cases, we just like build Legos. And it can be very small, and it can be very really big. Yeah, similar. And also, the next stage is so with the same concept, we can also include AI. So this project I'm currently working on, just like the same is similar, just like look at the same, right? But we, at the end, we use the model we train and integrate with Lambda service. So we can just create another website so for the this is for data to upload a uh, medical image and uh, using the machine to predict the output and uh, save to a3 and uh, we can build another find to lay then to download and see a result okay let's see I just want to share something okay thank you Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Sanford, which I forgot to put on this when I made the slide this morning on my phone, uh, <laughs> which uh, is going to come up quite a bit in this. Uh, so we're just going to talk about when UI doesn't make sense. Uh, and this is very relevant, as we're going to have found from this uh, conference so far. So all of our interactions with technology are built on our social expectations of how technology should work, um, which is great when they match. You're used to using a piece of technology, you pick it up, and you go, I know how this works, and I can work with it. But then you pick up a new piece of technology. Uh, maybe it's a computer you've never used with a different operating system. Uh, maybe it's a certain type of uh, platform that you've never worked with, and suddenly you don't understand the basic functionality of how things work. And it becomes confusing and annoying. Uh, and you think, 
Well, fair enough. I'm a tech savvy person. Most of the people in this room are tech savvy people. I'm sort of a tech savvy person. Unfortunately, expertise does not necessarily transfer. Um, just because you're an expert in a certain technical field uh, doesn't mean you're an expert in all technical fields or a new interface. In fact, it can make things worse because you're an expert. I should know how to use this. I know what I'm doing, but it's an anti-pattern. Uh, again, if I had done this more than, say, a few minutes ago, uh, I could have taken a picture of Dre during any point uh, yesterday. Or, in fact, earlier in the lightning talks that we just had, where people said, oh, yeah, the Macintosh isn't doing the thing I want to do, uh, because you're not used to working with a Mac. And suddenly, everything I think should work works a different way. And I have to unlearn that. And that's a ton of work. So. This is funny. This is nice to talk about. We're all getting a chuckle. What does this mean in terms of actually walking away from this conference? Well, the problem is we do a lot of stuff for libraries. And unfortunately, we are by far one of the less important ways that a lot of people learn their first way to search with information. I wish that was not true. But they learn from Google. They learn on their phone. They learn from TikTok these days if you're a kid. This is how you classify information. This is how you organize information. This is how it's served to you. And the expectations they come in with are radically different from our own. Uh, we work with libraries all the time. Uh, I did not put any library websites up here because I did not want to uh, throw anything at anyone, especially throwing anyone else under the bus where I like library websites. I love having a pile of multiple search boxes with ands and ors and fancy filters and tools. I'm a librarian. I love that. Uh, this is not true of most people I know who find that confusing or things that I'm like, well, if you've worked with this particular piece of software for a while, it's very intuitive. Click, click, click. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm a first time user of this software. What on earth are you talking about? Um, so. For all the problems we run into doing these presentations, I think it's useful to look at these and step back and say, well, when we build our own tooling, how does it work with folks who don't have the same technology background or the same library background? Or, as we talked about, also cultural backgrounds, just the actual interaction, device backgrounds. You're working on old, slow computers. You're working on, uh, mentioned, the limited to no internet access or limited to no email. There's a lot of users out there that we don't always think about, but are making extensive uses of our services. And we might want to reconsider some of how our designs and how they affect them. Anyway, that's my brief lightning talk. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Slides. Where are we at? This one. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Creative experiences. Yes. So, yeah. Good. Thanks. Hey. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is. <clears throat> Is uh, Caleb, um, and I work with I work with uh, digital scholarship and, and library systems um, at the University of of uh, Limerick, um, and uh, I just wanted to uh, to to uh, describe some work that I've uh, I've been doing there, and I've been I'm a, uh, I've been thinking about a little bit using using uh, metadata. Um, so. Uh, as we started to reopen library spaces over the last year or so, we have uh, uh, sort of an immersive AV space that uh, came into our building just at the very start of the pandemic. We weren't really able to use, weren't really able to launch. Um, and uh, once a year uh, at the university, we have something called called our Research Week, where we uh, invite people in from the community and sort of uh, different faculties and different parts of the universities uh, show folks what's been done. Um, I wanted you know people to see this immersive space, and I was thinking about you know some work or some or some uh, collections that we could use in it. Uh, so we 
have something called the Bolton Library. Uh, it's a uh, it's a collection of uh, twelve thousand early printed books, manuscripts, and uh, in uh, incunabula of uh, exceptional academic and bibliographic uh, importance. A lot of uh, early early printed material. Uh, it was accumulated by two bishops in Ireland um, in the early eighteenth century, and you know it reflects, I guess, the sort of the, uh, a historical situation where the you know collection was was assembled, um, and uh, the uh, history of science, technology, and uh, medicine are uh, are strongly represented in the collection as well as Irish history in the um, in the seventeenth century. Uh, it includes a number of manuscripts, the most significant of which is a medieval encyclopedia from the twelfth century, and uh, there's 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 a lot of possibilities there and I guess unlike a lot of collections like this it is something that wasn't uh, traditionally cataloged in the past that it had uh, sort of a printed bibliography and we uh, hired a cataloger about you know six years ago to do uh, to do work with a collection so when I started looking at the work that uh, my colleague Olivia had done. Um, she's, you know, cataloged about eight thousand of the twelve thousand items to date, and I was, you know, seeing different ways that I could use it in this immersive space. Um, and I was absolutely amazed by the level of uh, uh, cataloging which she had been able to do with this material. Um, you know, so like a lot of the records contain. Uh, 25 added entries, and there's a whole uh, network of sort of the tradespeople, uh, you know, booksellers, you know, printers that <clears throat> that uh, contributed to these items. Um, and I thought about ways that we could, you know, expose this a little more. Uh, I think while you know the records are available in our in our uh, discovery system, they kind of get uh, they kind of get lost in the noise of uh, Primo a little bit. Um, so I flattened out the records, uh, used some available, you know, tools to kind of expose the data in different ways, and um, you know, started to create a, uh, a sort of collections dashboard. So I, I just I I tried to use you know sort of freely open and available things like the uh, OpenCage API to do some geocoding, uh, Pladio to create sort of a network data. Uh, uh, around the information that you had in the records uh, and things like that. Um, and I seem to have lost my points here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. So uh, I think the important thing about this that I, uh, was actually being able to expose the uh, metadata records as, as a sort of data set. And, uh, uh, and also using that data set to sort of the, <clears throat> sort of acknowledge the uh, labor that went into uh, creating the metadata and sort of using it in a different way than it's you know traditionally used in the catalog. So, thanks. Hi, everybody. This is uh, definitely a tech side, but I also think that like, I'd love for my manager to know this perspective, and I'd love for the librarians to know this perspective. So uh, I'm going to pose that tests are self-care. And if you know me, you know that I have some strange ideas. And so I like to think of myself as three people. Yeah, it's a little out there, but hear me out. Me yesterday, me today, me tomorrow. So why are tests self-care? Think about it. Think about when you needed to change code that was untested. 
how did you feel? How did that make you feel? For me, it makes me feel really nervous, a little bit sad, kind of angry. And then think about when you needed to change code that was fully tested. How do you feel? I'm like, yes, yes, this is good. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can change this. I know I can do it. This is going to be nice. You know, maybe the technical thing is hard, but I don't have to worry about the other part. So when I get into code that previous me wrote, or anyone else, that has tests, I feel cared for. So when you're thinking about, do I have time for tests, don't just think about now. Think about your future self. Make your, your future self feel cared for. And so I posit, tests are self-care. Thank you. That's our lightning talks, everybody. Another round of applause for all of our great lightning talk folks. Gonna move some slides. I use a Mac every day. And I love it. <laughs> Uh, we are a little ahead of time. I sort of feel like maybe let's get started a little bit early. Do we feel okay with that? Yeah. All right. If I could get the next presenters, Jason Clark and Sarah Mannheimer for Responsible AI Building Tools and Frameworks for Transparent and Ethical AI Implementations. It's a video. Thank you for that. It is recorded. My understanding is that I don't have to do a thing. Hello, Code for Lim. I hope you all are enjoying yourselves in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, my name is Jason Clark. I'm head of research optimization, analytics, and data services at Montana State University Library. And today I'm gonna to talk about a grant project that a number of uh, folks are working towards um, called Responsible AI Tools for Values-Driven AI in Libraries and Archives. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank um, Montana State University and my colleagues there, as well as Iowa State University and James Madison University who are other partners on this grant. And I will, I will list folks that are affiliated towards the end, um, but I'm gonna just kind of get into uh, what, what I wanna talk about for the first 10 minutes here, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so a little bit, a, a look ahead, uh, discuss a little bit more about the grant project, some initial findings, um, I'll draw some attention to a case study template that we're releasing that will be of potential use and uh, something of a takeaway for this community. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about future directions and calls for interest. So uh, part of what we were thinking, I, I wanted to talk through some of the project motivation. Um, that first bullet point um, about AI becoming common uh, is probably a little understated. Um, it seems to be exponentially um, increasing uh, in, in involvement, in interest, um, and so it, it feels like a bit of a tidal wave at times. And, and uh, this grant idea is something that we had in place maybe two years ago. We went through a couple cycles with it, trying to get um, trying to get an approval uh, and, and, and to build the uh, build some momentum for the idea. But uh, it feels like very much here we are. Um, and it's very, it feels vital and, and kind of alive and really sort of AI feels transformative and at times even disruptive. Um, so we're wanting to look at how do, how do we use this technology, improve our services, but also uphold our values. Other goals of the project include developing practical resources um, that help us think about responsible use of AI technology. 
particularly in libraries and archives and glam galleries, library archives, museum um, institutions, cultural heritage institutions. Um, we're also thinking about how these resources uh, can really emphasize ethical implica implications. Um, one of the things I'll talk about in a moment is just parts of what we were seeing as we were starting to learn and think about this, the way that AI is moving into our cultural heritage spaces. Uh, and one of our one of our sort of touch touchstones for this idea was uh, the Library of Congress and Kate's Ward in particular, um, who in her work has re-emphasized ways that um, being careful with technology, um, that might be that might be the lane that um, libraries and cultural heritage institutions can can lead with from within. Um, finding ways to be responsible, to think about why we do, why we use a particular technology. All of this was kind of percolating as we were bringing the idea forward. Um, we've organized the project into several phases. I'm gonna talk about phase one and phase two primarily today, but I'm gonna make a, a mention of where phase three and phase four are going. Um, so phase one was an environmental scan trying to understand the field. Um, we've done a review of lit, looked for um, various, uh, the ways that these projects, AI in particular, and we're using a very broad definition of AI. It's sort of, uh, it could be any form of intelligent, automated agent work, agency work inside of to do cultural heritage work. So it could be in metadata generation, it could be actual learning from cultural heritage data, like machine learning from cultural heritage data, could be things like um, <clears throat> large language models used inside of chatbots, that sort of thing. Um, but phase one was really kind of focused on what's what's out there, what's going on. Um, we are moving closer to phase, we actually started phase two. Um, and so what we're trying to do is bring in a number of practical working with teams that have done practical implementations of this kind of technology um, to draw draw out what they're seeing um, describe what they're seeing and build some case studies those case studies were going to be applied to a series of user workshops and scenario building um, exercises with a number of our a couple of the members of our grant team um, then we will move to uh, some additional um, workshops. And the overall goal here is to come up with a harms analysis tool. And that tool um, most likely will be a physical, we're thinking potentially inside of like a sorting card deck that you can use to, to sort through what, what you, how you would implement this and what kinds of questions you should ask as you're moving to implement, but we'll also probably have an, a web interface um, so that we're moving towards that harms analysis tool development in phase three, and then uh, a release of that tool, uh, including a handbook, um, right, uh, in November, 2024. So just, we're kind of at, at early, early stages, right? We're um, in March, you know, phase two, just the beginning of phase two, but um, the goal is an overall web resource and potentially physical resource that you could use to, to ask questions of any implementation of AI in your institution, and as well as a, a handbook and framework for that, for those questions and guidance. Uh, so phase one was that environmental scan. I just wanted to kind of quickly go through parts of what we were seeing. Um, here's, you can kind of see on the screen, I have a, a listed the, uh, process of that scan. Um, we did find quite a few articles, I think more than we all expected to. Um, initially from that, we sorted through 77 case studies um, just to understand kind of the state of the field. Uh, you can see, again, that keywords kind of gives you a sense of how we were thinking about AI in particular. So. Um, Kind of, kind of all a very varied right understanding of that. And again, I think broadly, if you think about automation, um, 
intelligent automation of glam or cultural heritage processes, that's like, that can be, that, that's kind of within scope for where we were. Um, we tagged the literature just because we want to understand things like institution type, size, region, what kinds of materials were discussed, and in particular, um, what kinds of AI implementations were happening. And then we did have an, a particular question because of our, um, really what's grounding this responsible AI question is what, it, what are the ethics? How do we think about ethics inside of these implementation? Uh, I'm gonna move through a couple of, uh, just some, some graphs you can see. Um, generally, uh, we saw a lot of work inside of academic libraries um it's probably more of a resource issue more than any any kind of uh <laughs> leading you know and it's a matter sometimes it's a matter of personnel i think is part of what we we're seeing here um but you can just kind of see what how we categorize things what kinds of where I, ai what types of ai were being or what which institutions were were you were starting to use ai um Generally, these were larger institutions. You can see that um, the regions we we just uh, wanted to understand where in where in the um, North American, generally North America, uh, United States, um, what types you know uh, where where we were seeing the the particular kinds of um, implementations. This is the part that I think is particularly interesting. We started to see. Um, what types of materials were being used inside of the AI technology implementations. So you can get a sense of lots of um, digitized items, um, occasionally some born digital items as well. This also gets at the technical and practical tags also gives a little bit of a picture of like where, uh, what kinds of language we could use to uh, find and, and do a survey of the field. Um, it also helped us refine that broad definition of AI uh, that I talked about. Finally, we, we did bring in this sort of ethical question to see if we could categorize anything inside of those, in, inside of that survey and state of the field to understand where the questions overlapped with the idea of ethics. And it was things you can see, um, generally it was about bias, transparency, um, maybe relations to how technology has a social impact. Those are generally the questions we were seeing. Um, a couple of takeaways, I'm just, uh, I'm not gonna read this slide, there are a lot of words on this slide. Um, but one of the things I want to draw attention to are the, um, we noticed that within ethical concerns, the um, sometimes that wasn't uh, wasn't directly addressed. Um, so we thought there was there was an opportunity again for this particular grant idea and this research. Um, most of the concerns you can see were were sort of like, oh, you know, this we tried this and the metadata wasn't good, right? Or or sort of like almost poking fun at the machine. Um, and, and how it wasn't doing good enough work. Um, so we, we thought we had an opportunity to just like um, build out on that conversation and, and see what else we could ask of, of these implementations. So within phase two, what we did is we put out a call for case studies. And what we were looking for here, as I mentioned earlier, was a series, a, a couple of project teams, not, not a couple, we were looking for eight in particular, eight project teams that could, um, be a part of these case studies. And what we really wanted to do with that is go into detail about implementation. So the grant team brought together um, and drafted a template, which I'm just about, I'm gonna release and, and show you, um, that allowed those teams to kind of pull together and work out how they, how they were, how were they bringing this technology into their organization, what decisions they were making, what technologies they were using. So this gave us a better sense of uh, how do we how do we categorize and understand implementation of AI inside of our cultural heritage institutions? Um, so that 
that cohort is starting to be in place. I'm gonna mention it in a second. Um, and then the hope there is to bring those case studies into that phase 2A, phase three area where we're doing some task, uh, some scenario building and user persona studying so that we can bring that into the harms analysis tool development. Um, but we needed, we needed a, a couple of, I keep saying a couple, we need a number of teams to go, go really um, into depth about how they're doing this work in their organization and about a particular project. Uh, the potentially these will be part of a, a special issue of the Journal of eScience librarianship, either in winter 2023 or spring 2024. Um, and if you've not part of this initial case studies, there may th that could be an open call, so you could um, include what your own case study there. Uh, but the cohort itself right now is um, eight teams from academic libraries, um, actually some computer research institutes, a genomic institute, um, and a health science library. So just generally um, tends to be, I would say, higher ed academic uh, teams, uh, just because those seem to be the resources, again, as you kind of saw in that initial survey of the field. Um, the projects are kind of are listed there and they're all over and, and, and there were there were interesting things like um, full on, you know, uh, projects that are doing training, you know, getting GPUs, building their own models and going from there. But there were also one of the things we wanted to keep an eye on uh, the vendor and library or vendor and cultural heritage institution partnerships. Um, so we have at least one team that is partnered with an outside vendor to do to implement. AI, because we felt like that was another uh, common implementation we were, we were seeing in not only the survey and the environmental scan, but just, uh, you know, as, as we think about other, other ways that AI might become part of libraries and archives would be through that kind of vendor, vendor relationship <clears throat> or partnership. Then we, we've conducted a few community calls to just kind of build some community around the case study work, introduce each other and just offer questions and, and start some brainstorming on how to draft. Um, so the, the release of this, this uh, the case study template is free for you to use. You can take a look at it. Um, and this is one of those things when we wanted to, um, for this group, um, allow them to allow you all to, to have a look at that template and use it for your own projects. Um, you can use it immediately. Uh, one of the, the cornerstones of that work is there's a section, I think about seven sections to write to, but the group did a lot of work in drawing out the ethical considerations. So these are the sort of things that we're, um, given what we saw in the field and what the imp implementations are starting to look like, these are the types of questions we're hoping to answer in the case studies and then bring those, those ethical questions um, into the harms analysis tool. So I'll just let you read this for a moment and kind of get a sense of it. Um, but the case study template itself does have um, all the other set, the sections. And there are sections like share your code, documentation, your readme, give us a summary, who's impacted by your, by this idea or by this implementation in your organization. So it's, it's a mix of, it's about seven things to write to, but um, you should feel free to, again, release. This is one of those things we're just wanting to get this out to the community. So um, as, you're, as you are able to review it, please do stay in touch and reach out. Uh, we're hoping that it's, it gives you a start on, on thinking about these, these questions about responsible AI. In uh, just sort of wrapping up this, this bit here, um, one of the things I want to make a call to you is there, there will be additional work. Um, and so all of our project updates are available at that URL, lib.montana.edu slash responsible AI. Um, again, we're, we're in that phase two moment where we're working with the teams to draft the eight case studies. Um, but as we move into phase three, there will be additional um, user workshops and eventually a prototyping of the harms analysis tool. Um, we anticipate there would be some additional calls for participation. So if you're interested, please just watch and um, stay in touch. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw attention to the the sort of leaders of this this idea, um, just so you have some names to associate 
with us. Um, and then again, watch for that Jez, that Jez Lib call later in uh, winter 2023. So, um, a re some recognition of the project team. Our project director is Sarah Manheimer. Um, she is the data librarian uh, here at Montana, Montana State University Library. Uh, the additional investigators are listed there. You can see. Um, I'm just going to call uh, Yasmin is uh, Yasmin Sharish is uh, at James Madison University and Hannah Skates Kettler is at Iowa State. So those are our external partners. The other Dora Lynn Scott, Bonnie, um, uh, and myself are part of Montana State University. We also have an advisory board. So um, this this is a group that we've done a couple of calls on, just to get you know as we're vetting the um, some of the the uh, template that I just released, um, looking for, for other interesting projects that they've seen. Uh, we've had a, we had a fall conversation, we're doing a spring conversation with the board, um, probably later, maybe in April, a little later, I can't say later this month, next month. Um, and then another thank you to the IMLS uh, for the grant um, supporting this research. Again, we, we went through a couple cycles with this, and I think it's important for for this group to hear. Um, sometimes your ideas just they're not quite ready, and so just building your building time and knowing that um, if you continue to develop the idea, you might you might have success. Um, I will leave uh, with that. So um, I just say thank you. I will be on on the call here in a moment to answer questions in real time, and I'm looking forward to a discussion with with everyone. Thank you. <laughs> My computer just went to sleep. Somebody to come make this not asleep. Well, it's it's locked. I need a password. Vincent Stanley. We have a Vincent Stanley in the house. Don't get locked out. <coughs> What's happening? All right, try one more thing. Hey, we're in. <laughs> so I'm in the keynote. Yeah, where are you? Help me out. I'm in the keynote. Oh, oh. great. There you go. And let me just hit play. Yes. Hi, I am Andromeda Elton. And I don't have my presenter notes here. That's awesome. Give me just a moment. There we go. Um, and I will be talking about numerous exciting problems I found when trying to build an interface for a machine learning project. Uh, but first, I'd like to mention that I'm, I'm that Andromeda on the socials, and I'm currently at JSTOR Labs. I would be remiss if I did not mention that we are hiring for both a UX designer and a developer right now. So if that sounds like fun to you, talk to me or my numerous labs colleagues who are also here today. Anyway. 
Before JSTOR Labs, I was on a grant with the Library of Congress doing a research project where they had some people throw machine learning or other large scale computational approaches at their collections to basically figure out what happened and what their capacity was for supporting that kind of project. And along the way, I realized that I know a lot of the questions you're supposed to ask about ethics in machine learning projects. I teach a class where we talk about that for like half the course. But I had no idea how to write the next line of code. Everything I knew was up at the 30,000 foot view. It was about these big ethical questions and it didn't provide me any guidance as a software developer. Um, I spent a while looking in literature. I didn't find anything that was really concrete. Maybe I suck at looking at literature. I talked to people. I didn't get anywhere with that. So I'm going to spend this talk asking a lot of the questions that came up to me as I was working on this project and hope that some of you know where I can find the answers. I've already started to see some good uh, things in that direction in Slack and in presentations the last couple of days. Um, but I hope there's lots more stuff that's really about the nuts and bolts of writing code. I should also uh, mention before I get into this, uh, because I was working with uh, historical materials, which can be a trash fire, there's a bit of a content warning associated with this talk. Um, I was personally really interested in uh, Reconstruction era materials because I think that's such a critical period to how we understand what the American project is all about. Um, and so yeah, reconstruction, it has its issues. I'm gonna avoid specifically using any of the language or putting any of the images on screen, but I need to give you enough context to understand what I was thinking about. So with that said, let's think about autocomplete. Uh, here we are looking at the Library of Congress website, which I spent some time when I was thinking about autocomplete, seeing how the Library of Congress did it and various other libraries as examples. And if we zoom in on this screenshot, uh, what we can see is if we type in a string, its autocomplete uh, suggestions are strings that start with that substring. So if you type in K-I-T-T-E, that's kittens, which is totally great. Everybody mostly loves kittens. But you can imagine you might type in other substrings, such as, for instance, the first few letters of a racial slur which you can find a lot of in Reconstruction Era materials. And I wondered what happens if I type that in. And I, in fact, got the autocomplete of the whole string. Is this what we want? Like, I don't know. I feel like as librarians, we're pretty insistent that if we have materials in our collections, people should be able to find them. But do we want to streamline that pathway or do we want to really make people look specifically for that kind of content if they want to find it. I don't know. Uh, so having talked about autocomplete, let's talk some about search. Again, as with autocomplete, I think we generally want to make even problematic materials in our collection accessible. They're in the collection for a reason and there are all kinds of legitimate scholarly purposes people might have, but it's worth thinking about whether we want to streamline that process of providing access. So for instance, uh, if we have search, do we want to have a safe search mode? Uh, what would it cover? If we have it, should it be the default? Uh, we might also think about relevance ranking. Do we want to downrank certain kinds of content so people have to really go looking in order to find it? Uh, for instance, DuckDuckGo downranks Russian disinformation sites. You can still find it if you really want to poke through like multiple screens of search. That might be really what you're looking for but they try not to push that on people as something that they get easily when they're looking for other things. Another question that came up for me was about visual materials. Uh, I was training only on text-based materials, which I guess I learned from the last talk is not the most common use case. Um, but I used thumbnail images in my interface, so I was also concerned with the display of visual materials. Um, so I looked at how other people handle the possibility of, you know, blindsiding people with audio or video that might be distressing. Um, 
I found the Tufts Archival Research Center has a policy of using a content or a cover image on certain materials. And there was a conversation about that in Slack yesterday where I think Princeton and Swarthmore both talked about doing similar things. I would have given you a screenshot of, of what that cover image looks like in practice, but I was unable to find an actual example in the catalog. And it turns out there's only so long I'm willing to go throwing like horribly racist search terms at a catalog to find a screenshot before I hate my life. So I just made this instead. Um, anyway, so using a cover image, I, th I think is actually kind of an elegant solution because it still makes the content really accessible, but it doesn't sort of jump out at anybody without warning. It's, it's kind of like a content warning, that's nice. Um, but it raises a lot of other questions for me in terms of how do you identify the content that you want to put cover images on? Um, you could try metadata, uh, but I think we all know that uh, metadata is likely to be both over and under broad in identifying content. And we've also seen some talks the last couple of days that point to the various ways that metadata might not quite be congruent with your notion of problematic content. Uh, we could do a comprehensive human review of all the images in our collection in the fantasy world where we have the budget for that. Also, I'm pretty sure if we do that, I've just come up with a plan for making your student workers go through all the worst stuff in your collection, and I don't like that plan. <laughs> um, thank you. We could build a feature as developers to allow users to do ad hoc flagging of potentially problematic content, which we then review later. Um, at this point, we're not actually trying to have a policy of not inadvertently exposing our users to problematic content. We're having a policy of trying not to do it more than once. Um, that might be the most feasible thing, but it's a different kind of policy. And in addition to that software development to have the feature, you do have to back that up with ongoing policy and review practices. Uh, what about computer vision? I faked this image, like I drew the bounding box on the person, but if you've seen computer vision, this is what it looks like. It, it draws boxes around potentially interesting things and labels them. Uh, but in addition, if you've seen computer vision, especially on historical images, you know that it's kind of not great. Um, computer vision systems are trained on sort of modern high quality images and they often don't work really well on older archival scanned images, black and white images. Um, and they tend to have these really sort of high level tags like person and car, which are not useful for identifying a lot of things, but particularly for identifying problematic content, right? Because whether or not a photo of a person is distressing potentially to an end user isn't a question about whether or not they're a person, it's a question about whether or not, uh, what their context is. You know, whether or not somebody is enslaved is not something you can necessarily identify from looking at a photo. The photo of the same person in 1860 versus 1870, one of those may represent enslavement and one of them may not, and you can't tell with the computer vision system. So I love the cover image idea. I'm not sure how to implement it in practice. Um, and finally, one more topic, which is mostly actually not about what code to write, but the conditions of writing it, which turn out to be inseparable from the questions of what to write. Uh, and this is a rare part of the talk where I actually have a few things I am sure of and I'm not asking questions about, I am issuing statements. But don't worry, I'll just mostly have questions at the end. Uh, so one thing is someone has to do the work. Like I said, I spent a couple times in the course of this project just going to various library sites and throwing problematic search terms at them to see how they reacted and what kinds of decisions their developers and designers had made. And these were absolutely some of the worst days I have ever had in the library field. And I don't even belong to very many marginalized populations. I didn't belong to the ones by and large whose search terms they were using. And, and this still sucked. Someone has to do the work. And you need to think really carefully about who is gonna be doing that work, why it's them, and the fact that they may do like three hours of work in the morning and then need to go home and play video games for five hours. And like, that's still their job. That is not time off. That is time that they need to recover from the work that they are doing. This step is not optional. 
in addition, the work has to live somewhere. A lot of us write open source code. So maybe, you know, you've come up with a list of problematic search terms that you want auto to complete to handle differently because you're going to have to make that list if you want special handling for certain kinds of content in your collection. And so you just like get push origin main like you always do, right? Oh no. Is this what you want? Do you want a list of racist slurs in your public GitHub? Can you hear your communications and legal departments right now? I can hear them. I don't think they're very happy. So there you go. Like I said, this is a talk of all questions and no answers because I never did find a lot of guidance on how to connect these really big picture questions about bias and privilege and history and content to the really concrete and specific questions of what line of code do I write next? What features does this site have? How do I implement those features? Um, but maybe you have answers to that or uh, maybe if I go back to my computer, I'm going to find like 50 links to papers I never managed to find due to the aforementioned probably sucking at lit review. Um, maybe you are now as obsessed as I am with the absence of these papers and you are thinking about how to write them and when I look at Code for Lib Journal next year, I'm going to find some really great thoughtful stuff. Um, so let's go team. Thank you. All right, next up. Is this one? Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you have yeah. Notes we'll make it happen. I got you. Okay, thank you. Everyone, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Ryden Van Bronckhorst. This is Charlie Collett. Um, we're both software engineers for the California Digital Library, working with the Hathi Trust. And we're going to be talking about our research um, using AI for mar uh, ma matching mark records. So Charlie's going to start off with a little bit about the Hathi Trust. Um, for a little background, if you haven't used the Hathi Trust, the Hathi Trust is a, is a large... Oh. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> if you haven't... Um, if you, if you haven't been to the Hathi Trust website, it's a large digital repository. We're almost up to 18 million uh, digitized scans. Most of those are monographs or serials. We have over 60 contributors now. Um, they're international, but most are concentrated in universities in North America. So just diving right in, here's an example of um, going to the catalog and searching and getting a, a book. Um, we can then, because it's public domain, go look, and this is what the page turner looks like. And um, this particular copy was from um, Michigan, University of Michigan, and uh, it was a book that then was scanned by Google. And then um, it was submitted to the repository along with metadata. If we go back out to the catalog again, we can see that there's actually two items, and they're not the same scan duplicated. Um, a book came off of University of California shelf, also got digitized by Google, and they were both submitted with metadata. And we know that this is the exact same um, Prince and the Popper uh, edition because of an OCLC number. So that's how we do matching. If you look on the side, there's a whole bunch of copies of the exact same work, but they're all different editions, and we know those are not matching these items because they, they have different OCLC numbers. Yeah, so how might we match without these, oh, how might we match without these identifiers? So sometimes records, um, either they're old records, um, records from other countries, they might not be using OCLC for their um, primary identifiers, or they might not have them in the records. Um, so if you think about matching mark records on bibliographic information, how would you do that? You could do an exact match between different fields in the mark records, but we were curious about allowing for some variation. So variation in bibliographic information does not always indicate that they're actually mismatching records. Um, so exact matching between fields can miss out on some matched pairs. Um, so in this example, we have um, two titles that are actually referring to the same digital item 
but one is uh, cataloged as biographical story of the Constitution, and the other is biography story of the Constitution. So because of this, our matching concept is first to extract and normalize fields from uh, a pair of MARC records, then measure the similarity between uh, these normalized fields separately, um, and then finally combine these individual field similarities um, to determine whether the records are a match or a mismatch. So you can see the fields we're pulling from the mark on the right side. Um, right now we're only using a handful. Um, and so the first way you might compare string fields is with like an edit-based string similarity. Um, so in this case, um, to convert one title to another, we have to to the other, we have to remove ICAL from biographical and then add a Y to turn it into biography. And so this is a total of five changes. Um, and then using the lengths of the two titles along with the number of changes, we end up with a similarity score of 93.1%. Um, so this is a character level comparison, um, which is nice because it allows for small differences like typos without sacrificing the similarity score too much. But it, it, it totally ignores uh, word boundaries, which can be a problem. So in this second um, way of comparing strings, this is a token-based um, similarity measure. Um, and so this is a word level comparison, um, meaning we have to remove the entire word biographical and replace it with biography and by the same um, calculation, but with the number of words instead, we end up with 75%. Um, so it has a higher pen penalty for small differences, um, but it respects the word boundaries, which can be very meaningful because in um, alphabetic languages like English or other um, languages, um, the meaning is at the word level, not necessarily the character level. So just something to note, um, just because the similarity of two titles is high does not necessarily mean that they're actually the same title. Um, and this has been one of the main areas of research for us is how do we, how do we know that two titles are the same title? Um, so small differences can be really, really meaningful. Um, in this case, we have making a rose garden and making a rock garden are the two titles. Um, and this actually has the exact same token-based score as that biographical story of the Constitution. Um, so we can't really rely on the similarity of the title field alone. So matching records can have variation. Um, if we look at all of the fields for um, this pair of records, we see that there really only is variation in the, in the title field, um, at least of, of from what we're extracting from the mark. Um, but then if we look at this pair of mismatches, we see that there are more um, differences between these records. So we have um, Rose and Rock in the titles. The authors are slightly different. We have Henry H. Saylor and Henry Sherman Adams. The publishers are actually the same, but they're written slightly differently. One has and company. And then um, also the page count is different in the physical description. So finally, what we can do is create um, a vector so a vector is just like a, an array of, of numbers. Um, and so for title, author, and publisher, we use a token-based measure to calculate these similarities. So we end up with 75%, 33%, and 66%. And then for publication date, place, and the physical description, we actually use something more along the lines of an exact match, um, just where it doesn't make as much sense to use a string similarity approach. Um, so you can see we end up with this vector uh, like thing on, on the right side. And then we can feed this to a machine learning model. So our input um, goes into this first layer of the neural network, that's what it's called. Um, then it'll do a, a number of calculations and, and give us this prediction. And so this prediction is, um, it can be interpreted as the probability of these two records matching. Um, and so in this example, the model um, or, and this is often called uh, confidence of the model. So in this case, um, the model is only 10% confident that the records are matching. And so if we were using a 50% threshold, meaning um, we call um, anything below 50% confidence a mismatch and anything above 50% a match, then um, we would call this a mismatching prediction. 
So why use AI? AI ah. Why use AI? So we've um, we've experimented with just these similarity um, comparisons, and um, you can do quite a bit with just Python. And there's a package called the Fuzz, and you can do different types of similarity metrics on different um, uh, open or free text fields. And if we look at um, these, are plots of the similarities between different fields. So we've got title similarity, author similarity, publisher similarity, and you can see it's pretty intuitive that title similarity between records that are matching, so that's the orange. Um, two pairs that match often have the same title. It's very insightful. Um, and then kind of interesting with the mismatches is even though they're mismatches, there's um, a random chance you're going to have the same letters in your title as someone else because you're using the same alphabet. So um, it ends up to be more around 40%. And then author similarity, you can see we have organizational authors. Authors write more than one book. So you do have some mismatches that might share that kind of data. And you also have variation in the way that author is expressed. Um, and so you also have some variation from the matches kind of stretching below 100. And then publisher similarity, even, even more so. There's a, a lot of variation. So you could maybe write a script and try to take in account these plots on you know, how could you allow a little variation. But then if we take these similarity values and, and put them on um, publisher on the y-axis and author on the um, x-axis, you can see that there's a correlation between them, which is also intuitive. Usually if it's a match, it's going to have a match with the author and the publisher. But you can also see that maybe if you knew the title was nearly similar and the publisher was exact, that you can maybe have a little more wiggle room with the author. And that's having that kind of sliding um, availability to, to what um, threshold to use is a little more complicated when we're talking about scripts. And now we're going to introduce putting three correlation or three different um, similarities together. You can see that there are different areas in that box that you can see clusters of things that are matching and mainly clusters of things that are mismatches. And this is when you, know, you really probably want a more mathematical approach. And then when you add three more dimensions in there. You know, now, now we're getting really complex, and you can do a, get pretty far with using similarity, but when it starts getting to this, um, it, the mathematical approaches that are, are really kind of trying to find the, the exact correlations between all these different uh, features um, are going to, to make a lot of really good choices. But that also brings us to what about the data set? Because all those correlations that we're making, those cutoffs, are all based on the training data set we did. So, Records submitted to Hadi Trust, about one of them, uh, one third of them is um, English monographs. And we decided that for this exploration project, we we're going to kind of make it simple and bounded. So we did English monographs. And then we took a random sample. And when you're training a model, you need these two classes. You actually need examples of mismatches um, and examples of matches. And you want to try to have them in about equal, equal pairs. So we have. Um, about 100,000 records um, and um, 50,000 pairs. And um, they're skewed towards a tougher comparison. This is our second um, iteration of the data set. Originally, we had just kind of gone with random items and then other items that were copy, a lot of them were copy cataloged. And that really didn't tell us a lot about that boundary of when is similarity really important and when is dissimilarity really important. So we skewed them. So we wanted mismatches that kind of looked like each other, like doppelgangers. And then we wanted um, matches that were, had a lot of variety. So again, with all these correlations are really specific to Hadi Trust and this particular data set we made. And you can see that there's, for Hadi Trust, you know, access, if it's public domain, it's available. So you can see a, a giant push from contributors for um, public domain um, dated material. And so that's, that's probably going to be different than other collections, also lots of um, US uh, universities. So you're going to see the, that representation in, in the types of materials that are in um, the Hadi Trust. And it's just something to think about when you're thinking about applying an AI model is what, what, what data was trained for it. And it, is this going to apply to with my collection? Yeah, so how do we train this model on this data set that Charlie just talked about? So we have our data set, the working data set, and we split this into two portions. Um, one is for training, and one is for testing. So what we do is we train the model on this training part of the data set. And um, so what this is doing is showing the model example inputs of records and the correct output, so whether they should be matching or not. And then the model 
um, through training, we'll be trying to approximate a function that's mapping those inputs to those outputs as closely as it can. So then once we have a trained model, we can predict, uh, make predictions from our testing data set. So the testing um, records are records that the model has never seen before. And then we can evaluate um, the performance of, the, of these predictions. So now we can look at some results. So this is that example from earlier, biographical story of the Constitution and biography story of the Constitution. Um, really only slight variation in the title and the AI was super confident um, that these were the same uh, with 99.8% confidence. Then we have uh, making a rose garden and making a rock garden again. Um, this had a number of small differences in different fields um, and the AI was only 10.2% uh, confident in these. Um, now this one's sort of fun for anyone who's familiar with William Sharp and the pseudonym Fiona McLeod. Um, but um, the AI was actually very, very confident that these were the same item, uh, which is interesting because it's learned that um, sometimes even the author can be different um, in some uh, matching records. Um, so it was very confident these were a match. And then this one's interesting because it's sort of on the boundary of a match or a mismatch uh, if you're using a 50% threshold. Um, and so we have English trees and tree planting, one using an ampersand and one using the word and in the title. Um, there's an abbreviation for the name William in, in the record one. And then record one is also missing the publisher and um, page count. So for a little more quantitative um, look at our performance, um, this can be a little scary to look at, but um, what we have are two, these are called confusion matrices. These are um, kind of confusing. Um, <laughs> but uh, what we have, so we have two. We have one on the left is using a 50% threshold, um, and the one on the right is using a 99% threshold. So we're saying um, for the one on the left, anything above a 50% confidence um, is a match by the model. And then um, on the right, anything that the, the model has to be super confident that they're a match for us to call it a match. Um, so what these are showing is um, in these green highlighted boxes um, are the correct predictions or the, the number of correct predictions. So there's correct matches and correct mi mismatches. And then these red ones are the mistakes that the model um, has made. So in the left confusion matrix, um, the bottom left corner is showing the number of um, records that are not matches, but the uh, model thought were matches. Um, and then in the opposite corner, the top right, we have records that do match, but the AI thought were not matches. Um, so you can see for the 50% threshold, we have an, a high accuracy of 98.35%. Um, and so that the, the model is trained to do a 50% threshold. Um, and um, it has 120 incorrect matches and 48 incorrect mismatches. And then when we're very strict with the model uh, using a threshold of 99%, we're saying you have to be really, really confident for them to be a match. So we only have 14 incorrect mismatches, but then the trade-off is that your incorrect mismatches has gone all the way up to 643. So if we look at this over a number of different um, thresholds, we can kind of see the trend. Um, we have a decreasing number of incorrect matches with, inc with increasing threshold. And then we have um, a really big trade-off with the number of incorrect mismatches as we increase that threshold also. So how does this compare with different methods? Earlier we mentioned um, string comparisons. So we're using that as input to the model, but what if you were to use that without AI at all? Um, and then also how would that compare with maybe exact matching, exactly um, make, like making the titles exactly the same string or something like that? Um, so now we've added um, two more columns to this graph. And you can see um, from the table that fuzzy, so we're calling fuzzy um, just string matching without any um, AI. Um, so fuzzy and exact matching, we're able to get the um, false positives or incorrect matches all the way down to three, three and zero. 
but their incorrect mismatches shot all the way up to th almost 4,000. Um, and so depending on how important um, accidental matches are in how you might want to use this kind of AI, um, it might actually be worth it to um, have a, a much smaller number of incorrect mismatches. So we have a lot of work ahead. Um, piloting a corrections workflow, we're kind of planning to flip the model on its head and actually look for um, pairs or rec records in our uh, existing um, collection that are uh, mistakes in the grouping. Um, so things that are, the model is really confident are different items. Um, expanding character sets and language representations. So right now we're only looking at English monographs. Um, expanding fields and features. So right now we're only using that handful of, uh, handful of fields from the MARC record. Um, and it's just a, a, an issue of uh, MARC records being really noisy and hard to, and um, kind of unreliable in many fields. Um, then missing values in MARC field sparsity, like I just mentioned. Um, string similarity research, um, like I said in the very beginning, it's, it's really difficult to find a way of comparing two titles that actually tells you if they're the same title. Like maybe they have similar text, but they might not be the same title. Um, and then comparing abbreviations, earlier we saw um, an abbreviation of an author's name, William versus W. So thanks. Um, I'm, we're, we're both on Slack, Arvan B and C call it. Um, we would love to reach out. I don't know if we have uh, time for, okay, no time for questions. Um, but here's some model information. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? All right. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit over, but it's fine. You have all your time. I'll give you a little timer cards over there if you need it. Hey everybody, I'm Emily Linema. I'm the head of digital media software development at Indiana University Libraries. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk today about a project IU has been working on um, to try to build a tool to help collection managers um, use AI to create metadata for audiovisual collections. So I think I'm the last AI talk of the day. Um, oh, I'm going to go back here and just say if you want to like learn more about the project while I'm talking, uh, the project website is go.iu.edu slash amp. Okay, so I'll give a little backstory about why we've been interested in this work. I'll talk a little bit about the audiovisual metadata platform, which is the tool. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about the um, AI machine learning tools that we've been trying to use and which, which ones we've been trying to use and how well um, they seem to be working. Um, so the backstory for this presentation really requires that I mention the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative at Indiana University. So this was a really massive project to digitize um, cultural and historical audiovisual materials from across the university. And there's a really great website, mdpi.iu.edu, <laughs> if you're interested. Um, so the digitization ran from about 2015 to 2021. Um, and it was across Indiana University um, and in, had included content from units such as the Moving Image Archive, um, the Black Film Center and Archive, the Jacobs School of Music, the Archives of Traditional Music, and like a whole lot more. There are a lot of people with AV content across Indiana University. Um, digitized over 350,000 physical items, um, all kinds of really cool types of items. I got to see wax cylinders when I visited the Archives of Traditional Music, which are neat. Um, so I included this um, pie chart, which of course you can't read because I made it with a bunch of oranges all right next to each other. Um, oh, but I should have said my slides are in OSF. So there's a link on the bottom of the slide if anybody wants to kind of like geek out about different types of AV uh, physical formats. Um, okay, so the digitization project kind of highlighted a problem. So it's really wonderful that on the right, we have about 173,000 items that are accessible, digitized AV materials that are accessible to the IU community. 
but that's maybe half of what was digitized and that's probably being pretty generous um, as part of this project. Um, and the remaining materials are in a dark archive. So why? Um, well, obviously, um, one of the big challenges is that many of these digitized projects lack metadata for identification, discovery, uh, rights, um, accessibility. Um, perhaps the only metadata might have been some things that were scribbled on the canister or the container. And with such a large digitization project, uh, manual creation of metadata is really slow because everybody's doing all their normal work as well. And the funding for the project has officially ended now that the digitization is done. Um, so this is an example of a record from the moving image archive that's in our dark archive, basically a stuff that's not exposed yet. <clears throat> and as you can see, you really can't tell what this item might be about unless you were to actually watch the video yourself, except that maybe it's probably about Indiana University. <laughs> Um, and this is an example of a record um, the, from the Moving Image Archive that is available to the community. And you can see, at least here, they have a summary and a title that try to provide some information about what might be in this um, video. Um, okay, so um, enter the Audiovisual Metadata Platform, or AMP. So AMP is an open source platform that's been developed through several Mellon grants, um, working with a number of partners, um, including UT Austin and ABP. Um, its goal is to support metadata creation for AV collections by leveraging machine learning tools to create automated metadata. Um, you, the idea is that the user can compose these machine learning or AI components into workflows to create useful outputs like transcripts or named entity recognition. And that last bullet, we've kind of just begun working on the problem of like how to actually get output that's useful into systems where people manage and access AV materials. Um, so this, I'm not going to talk about this slide, just to say it, the work has been going on for a while with a number of partners, and I'll just leave this here. Um, okay, so I have a three-minute demo video, fingers crossed, it's going to work, and it's going to show you um, how you would use AMP to um, build a workflow um, with a tool that identifies shot changes in a visual material item, and then run an, an item through the workflow and get a chance to see what the output would look like. Okay, so we're going to do a little demo of some basic functionality in AMP. We're going to start by creating a workflow. <clears throat> and this workflow that we're going to create is going to be to do some shot detection and uh, generate contact sheets from that. Well, that's going to be an interesting choice because people might be less familiar with that. So we're going to name this workflow, if I can type, uh, simple shot detection with contact sheets. Okay, that's straightforward. First thing we're going to do in building our workflow is uh, get some data. So here's our input data set. Um, we're going to use the Azure tool for generating shots. So the first thing we need to do is this little intermediary step called Azure Video Indexer. And so we're going to send our input video into that. And then we can get into the shot detection itself using Azure. Um, so here's this. So this needs the input video again. So it's really cool workflow tool from Galaxy. I can connect these up. Oops. Azure Video Index JSON. We'll make a second try on that. And I probably don't need this output here, so I'm just going to unselect it. Okay, so we have our shots generated. Now I want a contact sheet. Um, so I'm going to pick contact sheet by shot, and it wants my input video again, and then it wants the amp shots, and it's going to give me a PNG, so an image with contact sheets. Okay, so I'm going to save this. We've got ourselves a pretty simple, fast workflow here. I'm going to go ahead and add a tag to make sure it's published and available, and we are done with creating a workflow, and changes have been saved. All right, so now we're going to run this workflow. And let's find it here. Uh, so here we go. Simple shot detection with contact sheets. And the file I want to run is called body and soul. Here we go. Body and soul, part one, body. I'm going to run the workflow on this file here. Could run it on a lot of files, but we're just going to do one. And that'll take a minute um, to finish. So I'm just going to jump ahead into the dashboard in AMP, which is where we get all the results um, uh, from current and past. Um, workflows. And so I'm going to go ahead and grab the body and soul item just to show you guys what the output would look like. Uh, okay, so here we go. There's actually one running right now, but we can look at the contact sheet and you can see 
This grabs a frame image uh, for each shot it detects. And you can see we've got some credits um, information at the beginning. We've got some narration and some video clips interspersed. And if I scroll all the way down to the end here, you can see we've got some more credits and a little bit of dead space. Okay, so at the heart of AMP are what we call the metadata generation mechanisms. So these are the automated tools. And I'll probably call them MGMs a lot because it's really long to say metadata generation mechanisms. So MGMs, um, let's see. So in the video, you saw me pull in Azure shot detection as an example um, of one of those. So this is the list of uh, MGMs that were implemented in phase two of the AMP project. So you can see, um, the, and the goal was to have both an open source and a commercial cloud tool in each of these categories. So that was part of the research that this project did earlier. Um, so in addition to shot detection, we have speech to text, so creating transcripts. Um, we have named entity recognition, so tagging entities like organization, person, and dates. Um, we have video OCR, so trying to transcribe visual text that appears in a piece of visual media. Um, I mentioned shot detection, um, audio segmentation, so taking audio and um, creating segments that are labeled as music, speech, silence, or noise, and applause detection, um, which is creating segments of audio that are labeled as either applause or not applause, which may seem really weird, um, but is useful in a situation where you have multiple musical performances in a single recording, which is really common in a school of music like ours. Um, we also have uh, facial recognition um, because of ethical concerns. The way we implemented that was that you can provide a known face, so one or several examples of a known face you want to search for um, across one or many media items, and it will attempt to recognize that known face. Um, and also something called gentle forced alignment, which is interesting, where you can take a transcript that you may already have and a media item, and it will, um, this is um, from Caldi, um, um, attempt to align the two, two to give you a timed transcript. So if you start with a transcript that's just a typed out textual transcript or something like that, and you want it to actually be aligned uh, in a timed way with a, um, a media item. Okay, so how well do these MGMs actually work? Like that's kind of an important question. And of course your mileage is gonna vary depending on your materials. Um, but so we did some testing on this and I'm just gonna summarize it. Um, Sean Avercamp from AVP did a really nice presentation on this process at Code for Lib 2020. So there's a link at the bottom of the slide. Um, but so how do we test this is we pick a representative media item. We create ground truth for that item where ground truth is the sort of gold standard human created um, version of truth. So like for video OCR, this would mean a person watches the video and types down every textual thing that they see on the screen. Um, so we take the media item, we run it through an MGM we want to test, and then basically we diff the ground truth and the MGM and like it's more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. Um, and we calculate scores like precision and recall. Um, so remember precision is how accurate were the things that the MGM identified and recall would be how much of the truth did the MGM actually detect. Um, so let's look at some generated accuracy scores for different MGMs. So this is speech to text um, that created a transcript. The media item was a recorded TV program from the early 1990s. Um, and the chart shows the scores that we calculated after doing that diff between MGM and ground truth um, for both AWS Transcribe and Caldi, Caldi being the open source option in this um, example. Uh, and you can see we don't have precision and recall here, but we do have word info process, which is the first sort of um, set of columns on the left, which is good. So you want to have a high score there because the word information was correctly processed. And the second column word error rate is bad. So you don't want to have a high score there. Um, so and this you can see um, that um, AWS Transcribe significantly outperforms Caldi um, in this specific example and also in lots of examples that we've tested. This slide gives an example of some of the types of errors that might happen in machine generated output. So on your left, we see the output from AWS Transcribe for a phase in the transcript compared to the ground truth and there's no errors, so that's great. We like that, it's a short phrase. So, um, And on your right, you see the same comparison for Caldi um, and you can see that we have a variety of errors in that. Some of them don't really matter, like whether you write 1920s as a numeral or you write it out textually doesn't really make a difference. Some of them are much more meaningful. So 
um, if you, uh, the ground truth said Negro National Baseball League and Kali thought it said National Army. So those are two, that's a really different concept. And actually this entire video is about the history of the Negro National Baseball League. So it's a pretty important concept. Um, so just another couple of examples. Um, this is shot detection um, with Azure Video Indexer and PyScene Detect, which perform fairly similarly. Um, in this example, which is the body and soul video in the demo, um, the scores show precision of over 75%, which means we're not getting a ton of false hits for detecting shots, uh, shot changes. And recall for Azure is about 90%, which means that most of the shot changes are getting identified. Um, and you can see this in the comparison chart on the right as well. There are way more um, true positives, so that's matches between the MGM and what a human detected than there are false positives and false negatives. So like that worked pretty well. Uh, video OCR is harder. Um, here are the video OCR scores for an educational film from 1970, um, which is, we have Azure Video Indexer and Tesseract, Tesseract being the open source option. Um, remember the last slide we saw like 75% precision and 90% recall for shot detection. You can see these scores are lower in comparison. In particular, um, precision is bad with Azure's precision score at about 39%. Um, recall is better. And this is borne out by how many false positives you see on the right. You can see there are 592 false positives versus only 375 true positives. So we got significantly more wrong than we did right. And that matches with the low precision score. Um, video OCR can be hard. Um, there are a lot of false positives. The tools tend to find words on the screen that the human didn't. Um, and then some of the challenge lies in deduplication. So like when you're a human and you're watching something, it's really easy to type a piece of text down once, but when you're a computer and you see it through multiple frames, um, it's a little harder to know like how many times, when do we have new text on the screen? Um, and so the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, usefulness. So I've shown you a few examples of the raw scores, but I also wanted to highlight what's even more important than raw precision and recall is how actual collection partners feel about the accuracy of these. And I'm gonna skip ahead because I see that I'm almost out of time to the most interesting part, um, which is um, speech to text was ranked as being most useful. Um, also, I already mentioned Caldi's not really usable, but AWS Transcribe could produce transcripts that were useful for full text search, text for catalogers to scan, and maybe even transcripts for users to see. Um, shot detection MGMs were rated as being useful to provide visual overview and identify dead areas. So again, think about those contact sheets, um, especially useful for items where we don't know very much about what's in the video. Um, and both named entity recognition MGMs could provide output for catalogers. Um, neither audio segmentation or video OCR MGMs were really rated by humans. So this is our collection partners um, as being able to currently provide useful output. I'm just gonna go to the resources slide at the end. Um, IU is continuing to work on this project, the Mellon Grants ending in June, but IU will be continuing to work on it. Thanks. All right, everybody. I know you're excited to not see me up here because you want to go eat lunch. OK, so a couple of things before we head out to lunch. Um, this building is going to be open and unsecured, so please take all your stuff. Uh, lunch is in the same place as tomorrow. If you have talks after lunch, please make this is a great chance to come up here. Make sure you get your slides and stuff on here. Uh, check out this whole situation here. Uh, there are still breakout spots to sign up for in the back. Same place it's always been. Uh, if you get the way to Prospect House is uh, go up the stairs, go around the bend, go up the other stairs, go out the front door, walk down the rock pathway for a while, turn left. Um, somebody will probably be there to turn you left. And then big building with big doors. Thanks, everybody.
closing out a few of these. All right, now that one that we need. All right. <coughs> Yeah, I, I had a nasty sinus cold, so I sound like a frog. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. I guess we're good to go. Cool. All right. Cool. Matt, I think we have a uh, mutual connection in common. I know Deborah Bischoff at Trekball. Yep. Yeah, we're good friends. We went to uh, library <coughs> school together. So she's watching online. <laughs> yeah, 